change uniquely. This special drive in us elevates our passion for change. Even with all of these problems that the youth in today's world see, many still lack the sense of urgency and that is needed for a sustainable future. As a youth myself, I have every excuse to say no to action and yes to, be to bettering myself and my future. As we go through high school, college, and beyond, life gets extremely busy. From the lack of sleep to wanting to hang out with friends, many just want to focus on themselves and do what they want to do. This is good in moderation, but for us to make the world a better place, we need to make sure that we start to look outward and to care for our loved ones and those in need. From the small and simple things, such as donating and community service, to being the leader of an organization, we all can do our part to make the world a better place, one step at a time. From the Hawaiian perspective, we need to work for the betterment of the Lahui, our people. In ancient Hawaii, Native Hawaiians were not worked not only for themselves, but for, but for everyone in the Ahupua'a. If you didn't do your job, people could go hungry or even die. So it was super important to fulfill your kuleana. Translated in today's world, let us make sure that we do our part and work for the betterment of our lahui. This perspective also makes us unique on the international stage. As we think like how the native Hawaiians thought about sustainability, we will naturally become sustainable. For thousands of years, native Hawaiians lived off the land and thrived alongside it. They cared for the land and in return, the land cared for them. Showing their love for the land, they lived a zero waste lifestyle. The more work, the more we think like this and work like this, the easier it will be to be more sustainable. We need to make sure that the interests of the economy and these sustainable efforts are in balance with each other, neither side overpowering the other. As we take action and continue on our goals for a sustainable future in Hawaii, the rest of the world will follow. Nothing beats influence more than an example. For example, in September of last year, the Ka'amaloa pathway was able to go to the United Nations in New York City to attend sustainability conferences and meet with other leaders around the globe. We also submitted Hawaii's second voluntary local review, which reports on how Hawaii is doing on the sustainable journey. This review also shows the steps we are taking to meet our 2030 goals of the Aloha Plus Challenge and that are contributing to the Global Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs. We, as youth, represented Hawaii on the international stage and we were able to show others how Hawaii is leading in sustainability. The drive and cultural perspectives we had as Islanders and Native Hawaiians made us stand out in the crowd. Our impact at the UN will help shape foreign policy and political mindsets of many. One leader we impacted in New York City was the US ambassador for the United Nations, Linda Thomas Greenfield. After meeting with her and sharing our message, she later recognized her change in perspective when she said she now saw nations not as victims in climate change, but as leaders. In summary, I invite all the adults in the room to take action and think with the same sustainable mindset of many who came before us. <laughs> I also invite you to let your youth know that they have a huge responsibility on their shoulders. Yes, we have a lot more challenges to overcome, but if we start to take action now and instill those values into our, ho into our hearts, change will happen a lot faster. For the youth in the room, I ask that you start to instill those selfless attributes now and prepare yourself for what is coming ahead. I know that as we steadfastly do these things, we can make sure our home is still home for generations to come. He ali'i ka'aina, he kawa ke kanaka. The land is chief, man is his servant. Mahalo. Another round of applause for Mason. It's awesome. So I've been lucky to uh, get to observe Mason and his his colleagues, uh, which are colleagues of many, in these uh, last few um, months. And they, I want to say, uh, should be recognized because they were very humble. They were very well received in New York at the United Nations and then back here when they welcomed the ambassador to the UN uh, to Kamehameha schools, which it is for real. Uh, if, if I can just be real for a moment with all of you, it was, these are absolute real encounters 
with one of the leaders of our nation, the very same person who right now is making the case um, to uh, hopefully bring some peace to the to the Middle East and the conflict between Israel and um, and Hamas or those in in Palestine. And so the idea that our young people are interfacing with these leaders at the highest level, perhaps on climate matters, but on matters of humanity, do impress them. And they carry with that, uh, they carry some of those moments with them across the globe. So you really should, uh, you should know that it is important what you're doing. It's fantastic. So I'm just grateful to get to be with you here again in the climate strategy session. Uh, there's so much going on. And in the time since we were last together in this setting, uh, obviously something extraordinary happened and that was the fire on Maui. Now, about uh, seven and a half months ago, when we were speaking then, we were talking, if you recall, about being ahead of the curve, being uh, thoughtful in advance of a climate crisis, of producing resources through a climate impact fee or an insurance plan against what would happen to us in inevitably. And then what happened? Well, we had the largest natural disaster hit us in our history here in our state. Uh, the Maui wildfire, which took 101 of our loved ones, it uh, has reverberated globally. And what Mason was referring to, uh, our conversations over at the United Nations, uh, touched that, touched that moment. And he and I and others were able to share with the global community that it's not something that's abstract, it is absolutely real. That climate change is not just upon us, but it's actually now impacting us in real time. It's not an abstraction about how much sea level will rise. It is the truth. It is absolute now that we have a climate crisis, clearly, and it is going to impact not just Hawaii, of course, it's gonna impact so many, if not all of the world's countries. It's very real. And when the rest of the world wakes up, I can't tell you for sure, but they will wake up. Hopefully we won't have to wait until Mason and his colleagues are running the government and running universities and think tanks. Hopefully it will happen long before that and they will do those things, but hopefully the world will wake up before then. So my message today is we're no longer anticipating the destructive effects of climate change. We're now fully enduring them. That's what I said at the UN, it's what I'll say today and what I'll say tomorrow. The Climate Commission, the Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission, we value you. We need you to press the policy decisions that have to be put into place because it's gonna take all of our voices to actually convince the legislature and other leaders that we can't wait. Exponential challenges will arise otherwise. So. When we were speaking a year ago before the fire, we were in a much better place in some ways. We hadn't lost those loved ones. We hadn't experienced devastation of 4,000 properties. We hadn't yet uh, realized what will likely be a four or five or even $6 billion reconstruction. And that's all just a reality. Now, why do I refer to the fire as a climate event? Well, for one, it was one. It was the winds. It was the heat. It was the dried lands. It was the just general challenges that we have, which we have to solve on water across our state. All of these things are a factor of the climate impact that we felt. And they're feeling it in Canada and Greece and California and really everywhere. And so we were just one moment in time that created a catastrophe, but everyone will face something like this. So I think what we have to do is we have to be totally serious about this and just incorporate it into all of our policymaking, which is to say some amount of resources every time someone travels to the state of Hawaii, every time we put a policy position into place, we have to consider climate. And we can consider it from the standpoint of it's just the right thing to do for future generations or we can look at it from the perspective of it's the right investment to make in the sense of prevention. 
preventing the next catastrophe from occurring. So what we end up talking about is the things that we all have believed in, resiliency of our grid, renewable energy, decreasing over time our carbon footprint. All of these, if we don't take them on, will create social vulnerabilities. And that's what we saw. We saw that absolutely on Maui. And that's why I'm going to keep fighting for uh, the climate impact fee. Call it what you will. It's really just a commitment to make sure there are enough resources to create uh, the green uh, environmental cores, to create the opportunity to put more money into renewables, to prevent some of the disastrous consequences of climate change that are already on us. They're still debating these issues, even now here with just a month left in the legislature. Some take years to pass, as we all know. Is it fast enough? No, it never is. But I don't want people to ever despair because uh, I will tell you that sometime in the very near future, one of the following solutions is gonna occur. They're either going to accept the fact that a climate impact fee makes sense, just to help us with these projects in the future, or they will accept that using some of the TAT tax or raising the, the transit accommodation tax is prudent. Prudent to help us protect ourselves and our INA and our future. And if they don't do that, I have other ideas. The, right, uh, the current balance is $1.5 billion in the um, rainy day fund. The resources that are generated from that every year are about $60 million. And if I have to, I will begin to hold that money aside until a group of, of like-minded people decide to use that going forward. But one of these solutions has to be put into place so that Don can do the job that DLNR needs to do, so that all of us can support the ideas that Mason and his colleagues have proposed. So what I want to say in summary is our legacy, our legacy as a result of the fire, our legacy as a result of being so noticed now in Hawaii should be real policy change that others can emulate. This is not the greatest way to come to attention, perhaps a fire, but I can tell you this, my meeting before you, uh, before I got to be with you was with the director of Homeland Security. My meeting at the end of the day today will be with the Secretary of the Navy and the Deputy Secretary of the Navy to talk about ways to sustain Hawaii, to help us move forward with sustainable energy, to make sure, to make sure that they address Red Hill in the right way with our values. So because of the fire, because there's so much attention on Hawaii, people like me, a governor of a smaller state, or Mason, a ninth grade student quickly on the rise with excellent teachers actually get noticed and our voices get heard. So that's the message I wanted to convey. Our voices are out there. I think people are uh, interested and I think that we will ultimately have a profound impact on how the rest of the world looks at climate change. So keep doing this, please. Know that the fight is the right one that we've taken up and just know that with even a modicum of partnerships, as we see from the East-West Center, the greatest colleges and prep schools in our state, and a few people that care deeply, all of whom are sitting here, plus a few at the legislature, we have the chance to really motivate the world to do better things. So thank you for welcoming me today. I hope this is an extraordinary venture that you continue to take, and know that I'll do all that I can to, at some point, get a major victory for us on climate uh, so that the strategy that you come up with can be fully implemented. Aloha. Mahalo, Mason. Mahalo, Governor. Um, you know, it's just really inspirational to, to see the next generation coming up and being so thoughtful and, and eloquent and also, you know, reinvigorating to, to know that we have your support um, and continued commitment to climate change. Um, as you said, you know, we're facing the impacts now and they're more devastating than I think any of us could ever have imagined. So um, just to know that, that you have our backs and, and that we're all fighting the good fight is just wonderful to know. So mahalo. Round of applause again for Mason and Governor, please.
So before we get started with our uh, first session, I um, just wanted to give a quick overview of the day's events and also some logistics. Um, first of all, bathrooms downstairs. Um, if you follow the hallway around to your left and keep going left, that's where bathrooms are. There's also a bottle refill station over here. We of course have coffee, tea, and juices on your left. Please help yourselves throughout the session. Um, today, we are really honored to be joined with, by um, the Hawaii authors for the Hawaii and Pacific chapters of the fifth National Climate Assessment. Um, that's going to be our morning session. Um, and then we'll break for lunch. And when we come back, um, we'll actually be hearing directly from um, community members from Mahaina on you know, what they've seen and experienced. Um, and um, then we'll be sharing, um, doing a workshop where we'll be sharing out some of the information from the earlier morning session. And finally, we'll be introducing our statewide climate action plan. So um, this is really an exciting opportunity that um, has been funded by the Environmental Protection Agency for the Climate Change Mitigation Adaptation Commission to hooey up with all of our wonderful county partners, um, other state agencies, um, and very importantly, our community members to build this strategic strategy on how we're going to find the right solutions for Hawaii um, to address climate change, so that we're addressing the social inequities that may come um, and that we are putting plans that are in place that we can be enacted as soon as possible. So we hope that you enjoy today. Um, we'll take a short break and meet back here at 9.45. Mahalo.
Um, but before we get into that, I'll just give a brief overview of how this morning will go, and then I'll introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jane Lachenko, um, who I believe is online now. Um, so first, uh, we're going to have our keynote. Um, there's going to be a facilitated question and answer uh, session with Dr. Lubchenko. So um, during her address, we encourage everybody to think of um, questions that they have for her um, and, and be ready to share them with, uh, with her in the audience. Um, then we'll have two presentations about the National Climate Assessment and the Hawaii and Pacific Islands chapter of the National Climate Assessment. And we have a lot of the authors that um, put their, their time, volunteer time over the last three years into making that happen, as well as a lot of technical contributors who contributed to that chapter in this room today. So thank you everybody for being here. Um, finally, we'll have a panel um, and that's a, a time to interact with the authors, to ask questions about the findings of the assessment chapter um, and what we should be looking at going forward. Um, then finally, we'll have, a, um, we'll have a networking session where we'll break out to the five key messages of the chapter in these tables that are scattered around the room with a sign indicating um, the topic. And with those authors at those, at those networking tables, We'll really be asking people to come up with um, with key ideas to take that I can take to the uh, to the comprehensive climate action plan launch this afternoon. So ways that we can fit in um, ideas from the chapter and things that are going on in the state and the counties um, to fold into that plan more seamlessly and make sure we're getting what needs to be done done. Um, with that, now I would like to uh, introduce our keynote speaker today. Dr. Jane Libchenko. Uh, Jane Libchenko is the Deputy Director for Climate and Environment at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She leads a stellar team that uses knowledge and innovation to help achieve America's aspirations of a healthy environment, stable climate, and prosperous, equitable, secure communities. They work to advance science and forge solutions on a range of intersecting topics, including climate change, nature, the ocean, polar regions, indigenous knowledge, equity, and environmental justice. Dr. Lipchenko is a marine biologist and environmental scientist with leadership experience in academia, civil society, philanthropy, and government. She previously served as Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and NOAA Administrator from 2009 to 2013, and as the inaugural State Department Science Envoy for the Ocean. She began her current role at the White House in early 2021 on loan from Oregon State University. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and other academies and has received numerous awards, including 24 honorary doctorates, the MacArthur Fellowship, and the highest honors given by the National Academy of Sciences, National Science Board, Department of Commerce, and the US Coast Guard. She received a BA in biology from Colorado College, an MS in zoology from University of Washington, and a PhD in ecology from Harvard. She has held faculty appointments at Harvard, Stanford University, and OSU. And with that, help me in welcoming Dr. Jane Lubchenko. Thank you, Victoria. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, great, great. Um, aloha, everyone there. Uh, mahalo nui loa for having me. Um, I am really excited to see uh, this fantastic group of dedicated experts coming together across all sectors for Hawaii Climate Week. Um, as Victoria mentioned, I join you as the Deputy Director for Climate and Environment in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I can tell you uh, from personal experience that President Biden is fond of saying that America can be defined in one word, possibilities. Our work, at OSTP is focused on bringing that idea to life by harnessing the power of science, technology, and innovation to achieve America's greatest aspirations. And we do this by providing advice to the president and his team, strengthening American science and technology, working with federal agencies and Congress to create bold visions, unified strategies, clear plans, wise policies, and effective equitable programs for S&T, and engaging with external partners, including industry, academia, philanthropy, civil society, 
state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, and other nations. I am here today in part because the climate and environment team at OSTP oversees the national climate assessment through the US Global Change Research Program. And we are here to talk about the information in NCA5 that is relevant to Hawaii and the Pacific region. Now, everyone knows, certainly those of you in the room, there's something quite special about Hawaii. I've sensed it every time I've had a chance to visit. And I know from working with your scientists, elected officials, native Hawaiian elders, and civil society leaders over many, many decades, that this is true. And thanks to those of you who are patient teachers, I've been honored to learn a little bit about the rich Hawaiian culture from ecological concepts like ahupua to the foundational Kumulipo creation chant. Among my many special times in the islands, one magical moment stands out. I was snorkeling to assist NOAA scientists studying Kohola in the humpback whale National Marine Sanctuary off Maui. A newborn humpback calf, just days old, judging from its fetal folds, was exploring its new world, venturing farther and farther and farther from its exhausted mom, mm -hmm. who hovered patiently in one spot, conserving energy until her calf was strong enough to make the very long trip across the Pacific all the way to Alaska, where they could finally chow down. I watched the mom and the calf from a distance, staying vertical and motionless at the surface, watching through my mask, breathing through my snorkel. And on each excursion away from mom, the curious calf came closer and closer and even closer, finally right up to me, close enough to sweep one long pectoral fin over the top of my head before casually returning to its mom. I wasn't expecting such a close encounter. I was both stunned and enchanted, and I realized I was still holding my breath, not wanting to break the spell. Looking at my colleague and nodding in mutual agreement, we decided it was time to head to the boat and call it a day, a magical, memorable day. Like humans on land, these kohola and all life in the ocean and on land are now experiencing profound changes as a result of climate change. Fortunately, we have the fifth National Climate Assessment to help us sort out what's happening and what's likely. As President Biden announced in November of last year, NCA5 is the most up-to-date and comprehensive assessment of how climate change is affecting all of us across the United States. It was written over the last four years by over 750 authors and contributors from every state in the nation, as well as Micronesia, Palau, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders don't need another report to tell you that climate change is real. You're seeing it, you're feeling it, and moreover, you are doing something about it. What we all need is a guide to keep us moving forward smartly, a guide to tell us what risks we're facing, what kind of changes we can expect under different futures, and what solutions can help us avoid the worst climate impacts. NCA5 is that guide. So what does it tell us? Well, you'll hear more in the next uh, few presentations, but at the very high level, number one, in Hawaii and the US affiliated Pacific Islands, climate change is here, very simply. The region is experiencing sea level rise, altered rainfall patterns, and rising ocean and air temperatures. These changes impair access to clean water and healthy food, undermine human health, 
threaten cultural resources and the built environment, exacerbate social inequities and disrupt economic activity and diverse ecosystems. We're seeing that. Number two, we are at what scientists call a tipping point. At this moment, we're facing some of the greatest challenges, some of the most urgent climate risks we've ever faced. But as the NCA5 makes abundantly clear, there is a strong case for courage because we are seeing unprecedented levels of action taking place all around the country, including in Hawaii. People across the United States have never been more dedicated, more active, more forward-looking in advancing climate solutions. It's palpable, it's tangible, it's exciting. Three, we know that adaptation efforts that build upon community strengths and that center local and indigenous knowledge systems improve resilience. For example, the restoration of indigenous agroforestry practices and traditional fish pond mariculture have aided in recoveries from natural disasters such as typhoons. These actions across the Pacific region address the many challenges we face from climate change, threats to nature and biodiversity and social injustices. And four, across the United States, Americans from national to state, territorial, tribal, and local levels are committed to climate solutions. You are demonstrating that climate action is not only possible, but is already happening, laying the groundwork for a better future. The Biden-Harris administration is your partner in meeting this challenge. Here's a quick overview of what we're doing at the federal level that enables and enhances your actions across the Pacific. Since day one, President Biden has treated climate change as the existential threat that it is. The president is delivering on the most ambitious climate, conservation, and environmental justice agendas in history. On day one, the U.S. rejoined the Paris Agreement. The president led and has signed into law the largest investments in climate and environmental justice ever through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. This bold investment in strategic climate action is expected to create millions of jobs enable us to cut emissions in half by 2030 and provide tax credits for technologies like electric vehicles, solar and heat pumps. Those actions in turn have attracted nearly $400 billion in private sector investment in clean energy. $50 billion has been invested to help communities build resilience to extreme weather and climate change. President Biden also launched the American Climate Corps to train at least 20,000 young people in good paying jobs at the forefront of our clean energy future. And President Biden has protected more than 26 million acres of lands and waters and is on track to conserve more lands and waters than any president in history with the goal of conserving 30% of Americans' lands and waters by 2030. In taking these actions on climate and the environment, the administration has directed through its Justice 40 commitment that at least 40% of federal investments go to disadvantaged communities. I have no doubt that President Biden will continue to take ambitious action to meet the urgency of the climate crisis and protect the future for generations to come. This is ambitious, it's bold, and we view these record-breaking investments by this administration as a down payment on actions needed to address the climate crisis. These above bold actions are complemented by other pioneering efforts that are focused on realizing the power of natural climate solutions to the climate challenge, stemming the loss of nature, environmental justice, and learning from indigenous peoples. In 2022, the White House released the first of its kind indigenous knowledge guidance to help federal agencies elevate indigenous knowledge in their work from research to environmental rulemaking to co-management of lands and waters. And every day 
we are working to provide clear, useful, and usable science and knowledge to inform the administration's climate action and nature policies, actions, and initiatives. One way we have done that is by making it a priority to improve the diversity, inclusion, and accessibility of the NCA5. For example, OSTP sought extensive public input and comment, including input from Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders throughout the formulation of NCA5, and to inform the consideration and integration of indigenous knowledge in federal research and decision-making. The National Climate Assessment Team participated in that consultation and updated its Information Quality Act of guidance for authors to better allow for the uptake of indigenous knowledge across the assessment. For the first time ever, we are translating the entire NCA5 into Spanish, which will be available in the coming weeks. Very exciting. We created a beautiful website. I hope you've had a chance to look at it that works well on phones and tablets and has a much improved search function. All 400 figures of the report also include alternative text for people who use screen readers. We've also pioneered some really exciting and inspiring new features that provide new paths of entry into the assessment. The report includes an original poem from the Poet Laureate of the United States, Ada Limon. We also had our first and very successful call for visual art with connections to the themes of NCA5. We had more than 800 submissions from adults and youth artists across the country and selected 92 pieces for inclusion in the report. Several of those pieces focus on impacts of climate change that are relevant to Hawaii and the Pacific Islands, including works that feature coral degradation, sea level rise, and impacts to Native Hawaiian communities. We have developed six podcast episodes that feature interviews with the authors, including an interview with Dr. Abby Frazier, the lead author of the Hawaii and Pacific Islands chapter. And we have recorded the overview chapter in audiobook format. So pretty amazing and fun new features to really make it interesting, accessible, and usable. Now, as we celebrate these achievements and the utility of the NCA, we seek to have subsequent products be even more useful by addressing data gaps that are particularly obvious for Hawaii, the Pacific region, Alaska, and the Caribbean. The NCA5 began to address missing data across the Pacific, recognizing the ongoing emissions in many data collection efforts. So we're really flagging this as a priority so that we can broaden the coverage, broaden the data, and have the assessments be more uh, comprehensive going forward. We see the need to prioritize research that includes full geographic coverage of the entire nation. And we would love to engage closely with researchers in this region to help close these gaps. So this matters and it matters because the NCA and the data that it includes are designed to be useful and to be used by you, your communities, your state, territory, territory or tribe, but also to others. The NCA is used at the national level in rulemaking and policymaking, at the state, territorial, county, and tribal level for resource planning. NCA is used in local mitigation and adaptation planning. For example, in 2018, when NCA 4 was released, Honolulu Mayor Caldwell stood with Pacific Island chapter authors to announce citywide plans for climate action to protect coastal infrastructure and shift away from fossil fuels. So there are many, many ways to make this report work for you. Here are a few more, but you shouldn't let these suggestions limit your creativity. If you are a student looking for insights, take a look at the narrative under the key messages that are most interesting to you. 
Don't forget to check the references. Over 8,000 of them that may serve as a foundation for your future research. If you are a scientist thinking about future research directions, take note of the traceable accounts at the end of each chapter, which detail the author's confidence in their findings and the pressing gaps in the literature. If you are a journalist or a science communicator, see the key messages of each chapter. This is where the authors have summed up the issues that are most pressing, the top takeaways they hope readers will get from their chapter. If you are interested in building resilience in your community and are looking for a scientific understanding of impacts, such as what can wildfires like the horribly devastating one in Lahaina, NCA5 includes specific findings and useful figures. Already, the fifth National Climate Assessment has received attention at the highest levels of government and vast media coverage. Following President Biden's announcement of the NCA5 in November, we've had upward of 14,000 people tune in to our NCA engagement webinars, and many others will participate in regional workshops like this one that are happening all across the country. Clearly, interest, incredible, authoritative, useful information about climate change and action is high. Now is the time for serious climate action. Now is the time for Hawaii Climate Week. So this is very well timed and congratulations to all of you. I want to close by thanking the NCA author team. Those of you in the room, raise your hand if you worked on the assessment this time. All right, excellent, excellent. Mahalo nui loa to each of you. The work that you have done over the last several years is just amazing, it's incredible. And it's important to take a moment to really appreciate the magnitude of what you have achieved. This state-of-the-art report on climate simply would not have been possible without you. Thank you for your commitment to this work, for volunteering your time, and remaining dedicated despite the many demands that I know you all juggle. You have contributed a tremendous service to the nation and your hard work is what makes the National Climate Assessment the most authoritative source of climate information for the United States. I am really delighted to have a chance to share some of this with you. I know that you're going to have great conversations. Uh, I really appreciate being here uh, mahalo for having me at Hawaii Climate Week. I applaud your efforts and hope you have a super productive day, productive discussions, followed by ambitious and informed climate action. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lachenko. And um, at this point, we have about seven or eight minutes for questions. Um, so Chelsea and Mari on the sides have mics, um, and they'll, if you want to raise your hand with a question for Dr. Lipchenko, either about the National Climate Assessment process, um, about federal investments in climate, about um, Office of Science Technology Policy, raise your hand, um, make yourself known, and they'll run a mic over to you. And please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kirsten Baumgart Turner. I'm the deputy director for the uh, Hawaii based National Disaster Preparedness and Training Center, FEMA funded organization, as you're probably aware, for natural hazards. And I'm wondering how closely the Office of Science Technology Policy works with Department of Homeland Security and the different consortiums uh, that are focused on the research based input on disaster uh, mitigation and preparedness and response. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. Uh, this is a very active area, as you know, from the work that you do. Um, we are uh, connected to FEMA and DHS colleagues uh, in multiple ways. Uh, we work closely with them, uh, especially in thinking about uh, how to respond to disasters in ways that are most useful in the short term and the long term for people, for their communities, 
for their economies, but also for the natural resources that they depend upon, for example. And there's a lot of really interesting work underway with respect to um, uh, new approaches and new thinking about uh, enhancing resilience to climate change. It's, it's obviously not enough for us to reduce emissions and to uh, capture carbon, uh, but there are changes underway for which we uh, need to be responding, need to anticipate, uh, but also the responses matter. And so the uh, National Climate Resilience Framework that the administration released uh, is uh, an expression of this interagency effort and dialogue we've been having to work together to identify the highest priority opportunities, both for resources, but also for knowledge, and then fold those experiences back into uh, the knowledge base uh, in an iterative way. So uh, what you all are doing and learning uh, is very useful to others, uh, and I hope the opposite is true. So um, the National Climate Resilience Framework, I think is a really uh, useful um, example of what it is you're asking about. Other questions, please raise your hand or go over to a microphone. And please introduce yourself. Hi, doctor. Uh, thank you so much for your enlightening speech. My name is Carlos Piaz. I'm, I haven't, uh, I live nearby Moana Valley just for about a, been in Hawaii about a year. I came from Alaska working as a resource manager and biologist up there. And I was just curious about your report. Does it also list um, a set of kind of metrics to see along the way to see how successful we are in meeting accomplishments and goals? Because I just like to, whenever I do resource management, I kind of like to have metrics to see how much successful we're having along the way. So thank you again for your real enlightening speech. I'm looking forward to looking over that report. Thanks again. Thanks, Carlos. And thanks for the interest in uh, looking at the report. Um, the authors that are in the room that are going to share information are going to give you a lot more detail and are obviously just an incredible source of information, especially since Hawaii is new to you. Um, in turn, you can bring some new ideas from Alaska. So that's the kind of uh, back and forth that is really helpful. Um, the uh, National Climate Assessment um, provides information about what we can expect it's not a tracker for what is happening now. That happens through different venues. Uh, for example, um, each of the agencies has uh, climate adaptation plans. Each of the federal agencies has climate adaptation plans that include trackers so that we can uh, see how well we are doing and what we said we would do, uh, transparency, accountability. Uh, but also to identify areas where we need uh, a different approach or uh, something other than uh, what, what is underway. Um, I believe that part of what you all are going to be working on uh, is thinking about the actions that can be informed from this knowledge of the Hawaii and Pacific Island chapter of the NCA5 and those action plans are where I think there is, it's really important to have uh, specific goals and uh, timelines uh, and to build into those uh, a, a tracking process uh, and accountability. Uh, so that uh, is, a, I think, a good opportunity for everyone in the room to be thinking about as you move forward with this information that the NCA5 provides. I'll just note that there was also a um, an assessment evaluation for NCA4 um, that I know happened last time, and that was kind of um, an assessment of the entire report's um, impacts, outreach, um, adaptations that happened um, and cited it. So I, I'm not sure if an evaluation um, will happen again this time, and Elise is giving me eyebrows. So. so thank you for mentioning that, Victoria. That's absolutely right on point. Uh, we are working with the National Academies to develop uh, an, an evaluation uh, framework, uh, and then we fully intend to 
use that not only for NCA5, but other uh, climate assessments going forward. So right on. Uh, thank you for noting that. Fantastic. Thanks. I think we have time for one final question or comment if anybody has anything. Oh, we got Nancy and Jonathan. Uh-oh. And Jonathan. That's arm wrestle. We can fit you both in. Aloha, my kaku. Um, Thank you very much, Dr. Lubchenko, for what was one of the best keynotes I've ever heard, hitting all the points. Um, my name is Jonathan Likeke Shoyer, born and raised here on Oahu and serve as an independent consultant on water issues. And this is more of a thanks and an encouragement. Um, I really want to thank you for mentioning your personal interaction with the Kohola on Maui. And um, I'm noticing your pin with an octopus on it. Oh, hey. Okay. Octopus is one of the Kanaloa, uh, is one of the body forms of Kanaloa, one of the four main gods in Hawaii, uh, the god of the ocean. And I'm think it made me think back to a small community-led conference a number of years ago in Lahaina about how to deal with sea level rise mm. in Wyola Church, which is now, of course, burned to the ground. But one of the most profound things that was said at that conference was, you know, we have to not just talk about sea level, we have to talk about Kanaloa and maybe less about retreat and more about his realm is expanding. So how do we greet him? And I mention that only because I think your courageous leadership to not just talk about science and policy and all the safe things you can in your role, but your personal relationship with nature and your experiences is one of the only ways in our fractured political environment to get past the very difficult policy challenges we have and connect across a wide range of difference and spectrum to get people to take the action that we need. So mahalo nui. I really, really appreciate that story and everything you're doing. Aloha. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I uh, That means a lot to me and I really uh, value uh, what you just shared with us. Um, a lot of words of wisdom there and I think it could uh, it will be very helpful in informing the conversations you all will, will be having. So, uh, aloha. Uh, aloha, Kako. I'm Nancy McPherson. I'm a planner with the State Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And I'm really glad to hear that there was significant outreach to and participation by tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations and cultural practitioners in this process. To what extent was the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the need for free, prior, and informed consent incorporated into the NCA5's approach to climate change mitigation and adaptation? Yeah, we uh, took uh, made it a priority to do a lot of upfront consultation and engagement just across the board multiple times, not just a one-off. That was not only with tribes, but uh, it also included a lot of engagement with uh, federally recognized tribes as well as indigenous peoples. Uh, and we uh, have uh, consistently made that uh, a priority uh, in this administration. For the NCA5, um, the authors of the report uh, operate mm -hmm. under uh, guidance that is given to them uh, to standardize things across all the different chapters. And that guidance includes information about uh, how to use um, what is shared uh, in those uh, consultation processes, uh, as well as what is in the uh, peer-reviewed literature. And so uh, the Authors who are in the room with you, uh, I could probably speak to uh, more specifics about how they did exactly that. Uh, but I can tell you that this is something that uh, is important to us and that we will continue to uh, abide by. So uh, Victoria, thank you so much to all of you. I really appreciate uh, the fact that you are all here. I'm anxious to hear what you all come up with. Uh, and again, my thanks to the NCA authors, especially those who are in the room with you and her, who are sharing the fruits of lots and lots of uh, hard work. Uh, and hopefully this will be something that is useful to everyone. Mahalo Nui. Thank you, Dr. Lipchenko. All right, we're going to keep on going. Um, 
Thanks everyone for sticking around and we're gonna be going straight through until lunch. So at any time, if you need to go to the bathroom, get some coffee, some juice, please feel free to get up and go get some. Um, next, we're going to be starting our overviews of both the National Climate Assessment um, overall, the process and some detailed findings. Um, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Elisa Lustig, who's the Senior Staff Manager for the US Global Change Research Program. Um, and she also led the Climate and Art Program um, for the National Climate Assessment uh, this time around. Um, and she's going to give us an overview of the National Climate Assessment process. So welcome, Elisa. Okay. Cool. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aliza Lustig. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm a senior manager on the National Climate Assessment Team, and I've been working with the Hawaii and U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands chapter now for two assessments, NCA4 and now NCA5. So I just can't say enough about how delighted I am to be here. Um, it's very difficult to follow Jane. So um, since she's given you kind of an overview of what um, the report is talking about, I'm gonna get into some more of the mechanics of how it was developed um, and hopefully provide some inspiration around how it might be used. So let's get into it. The US Global Change Research Program was mandated by Congress in the Global Change Research Act of 1990 to do just as it says on this slide, to assist the nation and the world to understand assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. USGCRP is a consortium of 15 different federal agencies, some of whom are primarily producing climate information like NASA, some of whom are uh, primarily using climate information, say like HUD, and many of which are doing a bit of both, whether it's EPA or Department of Defense or Department of Energy, et cetera. So the same law that established USGCRP as a program also mandates the existence of the National Climate Assessment. And we are charged to summarize what we know um, about climate change across the United States, as well as what we don't know, the scientific uncertainties. Um, the law requires that we're looking at eight different topic areas that are listed here on the slide. Um, and those are vast, whether it's the natural environment, human health, social systems, biodiversity, um, we're looking at current trends up until the present, and the assessment is also looking into the future 25 to 100 years. So with that, um, let's get into some of the, um, I guess, basics or um, underpinnings of that report. Um, our authors are looking at a very wide range of scientific inputs um, from a wide range of authoritative sources, whether it is peer-reviewed literature, we're including indigenous knowledge as Jane, um, as Jane spoke about. They're using their um, expert judgment to talk about, like I said, what they know, but also what they don't know. NCA5 was written by over 500 scientists from across the country. We had over 260 odd technical contributors also um, from all 50 states, as well as from Puerto Rico, from the Virgin Islands, from Guam, Micronesia, and Palau. So we had really good geographic diversity represented on the report and a very, the biggest ever actually in NCA history author team. The report is relevant for policy. And when I say that, I mean, we're asking scientists not to talk about science for science, but to talk about science in a way that decision makers from a range of different sectors can actually use. So we're talking in terms of risk to important resources and to communities and to people. Um, that said, we are not prescribing policy. So at no point do we say you should do X um, or we're not advocating for a particular viewpoint of any kind. We do though talk about solutions and we do that by talking about um, you know, the kinds of things that are happening right now and what's working and what's not working. Um, we're looking at a range of potential impacts. So the goal is not to say that you should, again, you should be thinking about 
sea level rise X by year Y, but to say by year Y, sea level rise will be in this range. And then we leave it to the decision maker to determine their own risk threshold and plan accordingly. Um, next, we are fully compliant with the Global Change Research Act. There are also many other laws and policies that we are compliant with, and that makes sure that the report is authoritative, that it is transparent um, and, so we, and, and accessible. So we stick very closely to those. Next, we um, provide multiple opportunities for public engagement. Jane spoke to that. We have public engagement workshops. We have opportunities for written comment. We did a formal government to government tribal consultation um, early on in the process. Um, next, as, as the authors can probably attest, the, the report goes through a lot of review. Um, so we have, like I said, several opportunities for public review. We had a review by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And then we had um, several government science reviews. Okay. So here's the NCA5 table of contents. We start with an overview. We have two chapters dedicated to the um, physical earth system. Then we have a number of different national topics, including two new ones actually highlighted in blue, one um, on eco economics and one on social systems and justice. We then have our 10 regional chapters, including of course, the Hawaii and Pacific Islands chapter. We have two chapters dedicated to how we are responding to climate change, one on adaptation and one on mitigation. But I want to be clear that we are talking about response throughout the report. It is not just siloed away into two different chapters. For the first time ever, we have a number of focus boxes. These are actually elected by the authors, which is quite cool, um, as you know, the uh, most pressing and cross-cutting issues that they wanted to focus on in this report. And then we have a number of appendices. OK. So now I wanted to give you a quick website tour. Um, and that is because this website has a lot of useful stuff on it. And folks are not always aware of all the different components. So I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, when you go to the NCA5 webpage, you are greeted by the overview chapter. If you read nothing else, the overview chapter will tell you the summary of what is in this report you can navigate to the different sections here. But my guess is that most likely you'll be interested in reading the regional chapter dedicated to Hawaii and the Pacific Islands. So let's go to that one. Okay. So every single chapter, let me close this down. Nice. Every single chapter opens with an introduction that basically lays the foundation for wh where the region is and um, you know key demographics and characteristics. Then each chapter has a number of key messages between three and six. These are the top line messages, like the headlines that the authors want you to take away from the report. And so in the case of the Pacific Islands chapter, there are five key messages. Under each key message, there is narrative text. The narrative text is what substantiates that key message. The authors are writing the narrative and then the key message kind of emerges from it. Um, there is art integrated into the assessment and I will get to that later. There are also a number of figures. If you go to a single figure and you wanna know how is this figure created? This is a photo figure, but data figures as well. Click this eye icon. This pulls up metadata. Metadata were perhaps a bit tedious for authors to compile, but they are critical because they tell you how a figure was generated. For photos that talks about you know things like copyright, can you use these photos for yourselves? But it, for uh, more quantitative figures, um, it will tell you where the data comes from. All data typically is accessible publicly. So you'll be able to find it, go directly to the source. And then it tells you how the figure was created. So you could take your own data and do a similar analysis or recreate the figure for yourself. This is a big part of report transparency. Okay, so now down at the bottom, we have the traceable accounts section. The traceable accounts are the receipts for the chapter. How did the authors come to the conclusions that they came to? They are talk about confidence and likelihood. What is the nature of the literature base? Is it big? Are we in agreement? Is there disagreement? That all exists here under the traceable accounts. Um, there is a traceable account for every single key message in the report. And then finally, the references section. This chapter has almost 500 references for 10,000 10, words of text. It is extensive. If you are a student in the audience, I really encourage you to check out the references. These, this is literature that is primarily published. We have some kind of foundational works, but it's primarily what's been new since the last assessment. There's a lot of stuff. 
um, in here for you to look at and to please use. Um, if you want to know who contributed to the chapter, that's all up here under the authors list, contributors list. Um, and in fact, if you go over here ooh, to report credits, you'll get the full list of everybody who participated. Um, and, and like I said, it's a pretty extensive list. Briefly over to the downloads page. This is, there's some stuff here people don't really know exists, so I want to make sure to talk about it. Um, every single chapter has an associated PDF if you want to download and annotate. We're going to be producing PDFs um, in Spanish for every single chapter. Um, all chapters have an associated handout, a condensed version, if you want to give people a quick overview. We have a condensed file of all figures for every single chapter, as well as a pre-made slide deck that you can use to start communicating um, with you know, through presentations with whomever. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Art by Climate Project because um, it was just so much fun. Um, like Jane said, we put out a call for art and then this gallery um, shows all of the art that we collected, a number of pieces very, very relevant to this region. Um, and in addition, there are, these pieces are also featured in the chapter itself. So please do come and uh, take a look at the art gallery. So I think that's it for my website tour. Happy to get into any of that um, more if folks are interested. Um, and I will close now with two slides about how the NCA has been used. I'm not gonna read all of this, but I just wanted to highlight some of the top line ways that the report has already been used in the past. Um, what we see a lot is that the NCA is used as to justify a call for action. That's true with Congress people. It's true here in this case in New York City, um, talking about um, their plans to uh, cut carbon emissions and limit global temperature rise. That's all because of the urgency laid out in the National Climate Assessment, IPCC report, and others. Um, they also use the NCA as a guidepost for planning metrics. Um, in the Southeast, for example, in Tampa Bay, they set their uh, regional sea, sea level rise parameters based on the recommendations of the National Climate Assessment. Um, the NCA is used as a starting point for teaching and assignments. So we see the NCA used as textbooks for classrooms, for example. Um, and that is uh, really inspiring and, and good to see it um, getting out to students in that way. Um, it is used as a reference for fundamental science. So we have in this example, the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco, um, not really using the NCA as justification so much as just for explaining what is happening um, in the climate system um, and, and potential uh, uh, ramifications for financial stability. And then finally, an example, um, the NCA to justify legal rulings. Um, we have here this example from the US Court of Appeals in, um, in DC talking about their rationale for regulating greenhouse gas emissions. The report is also used to launch new scientific research um, and, and papers, we've seen that happen. Um, and that happened actually quite a bit coming out of the last assessment, we'll see it again for this one. Um, and this is just a small sample and I'm sure folks here have their own examples of how hopefully you've used the NCA in the past. I'm really keen to hear about how it could be more useful to you. Um, so if you have ideas about that, please um, don't hesitate, I'd, I'd love to chat. Um, so with that, I will close and um, I think pass it over back to Vicki. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. We're gonna keep going because now we're behind time, of course. Um, and um, with that, great overview of the process and what went into making our chapter. Um, I'm now gonna go straight into the findings from the actual chapter themselves, which will help hopefully inform some of our networking discussions um, after this. And in terms of questions for Elisa, um, we're gonna have a panel with all of the authors after my presentation. So please hold your questions until then, write them down if you have something good to so you don't forget. Um, so I'm going to give a summary of the climate change impacts and adaptation findings in Hawaii from the fifth U.S. National Climate Assessment. Um, this is for Hawaii and the U.S. affiliated islands, but for the purposes of Hawaii Climate Week, I'm going to focus on a lot of the Hawaii results if possible. Um, we have our full chapter team listed up here. Um, as has been stated, it was a big undertaking, a volunteer undertaking over a couple of years to really get it to this point. Um, here is our cover art, um, part of the Art and Climate Initiative that, uh, that Eliza led and was talking about. Um, 
so this piece was inspired by the noticeable effects of climate change in Polynesia, where the author witnessed eroding coastal areas and the reduced ability to provide agricultural subsistence when they returned to Samoa after 25 years. So this is the heading on our chapter website. Um, the people that went into this, um, the people in time that went into this chapter include the 16 authors, a public engagement workshop, five topical area expert workshops that matched with the key messages, 41 technical contributors, uh, many more contributors who contributed were not recognized as technical contributors for one reason or another, but a lot of other contributors as well, 486 references and about three years to get it through. Here is our author team. You'll see a lot of these faces in the room today, um, and you'll get to talk to, uh, talk to them after this in the networking session. Um, but it includes a very wide range of geographical and technical expertise. So it's physical and social scientists, cultural practitioners, a diversity of career stages and affiliations, and different levels of expertise with, um, with uh, previous assessments, national climate assessments. In terms of uh, representation from the region, we have authors from Guam, Palau, four islands of Hawaii, California, and Massachusetts, where our lead author is actually a professor, Dr. Abby Frazier. Um, so here is a map of the region that our, that our chapter covers. It is Hawaii in the US affiliated Pacific Islands region or USAPI. Um, that region includes the state of Hawaii, the territories of American Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, and the freely associated states of the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Pacific Remote Islands. Um, and if you note, those bubbles around the islands in our region uh, indicate the exclusive economic zones, um, which, excluding the freely associated states, define nearly half of the U.S. EEZs in total. Another thing that these islands share and that we highlight in the chapter is a history of colonization. Um, and what that has done across the region is contribute to structural inequities and vulnerabilities that exacerbate the impacts of climate change. Historical under-resourcing has resulted in continuing data inequities. Um, for example, um, as Dr. Lubchenco mentioned, sparse and discontinuous climate data records are available for the region. Um, in many cases, there's a lack of downscaled future climate projections that are relevant at an island scale, um, detailed sea level rise exposure maps, um, are not available for many of these locations, um, limited groundwater and surface water resource monitoring, limited data on ecosystem reports. And in most national maps, the US affiliated Pacific Islands are not included um, as being part of, um, part of the, the US. Um, the national climate assessment in this round has improved uh, upon that and helped improve representation both uh, of Hawaii and the US API in the reports and the maps. Um, but we're always pushing for more representation for our region. Um, this is one of our, our key figures from the report, um, from the chapter, and it shows uh, some of the indicators of climate change in our region. Pacific Islands are already on the front line of global climate change. We're already experiencing changes in impacts on both our high and low islands. This is a conceptual figure that highlights the major changes in indicator variables across the region, a few of which I'll highlight here. As Eliza noted, all of the figures in the chapter are downloadable for public use um, in high resolution, and all of that data, metadata, is available um, to, to be looked at. So in terms of um, key indicators that our chapter focuses on, some of that is enca encapsulated in ocean changes. Um, changes in ocean variables are a key indicator of climate change. We've seen sea surface temperatures increasing acro uh, across the region that exceed global rates, ocean acidification reaching levels not seen over the past 30 years, um, marine heat wave trends um, impacting coral reefs, and coral reef degradation that could affect thousands of people and cause millions of dollars in damages. The figure on the bottom in this slide is from our chapter and shows some of the benefits provided by coral reef both by uh, protecting potential populations that are at risk from ocean impacts and the economic uh, risk that the, the coral reefs um, protect and provide. Sea level rise is another main indicator, as we all know. Future sea level rise depends strongly on the scenario that's used and rates are going to vary across the region. 
This figure shows sea level rise projections for different socioeconomic and emissions scenarios at Honolulu, Hawaii, down in the bottom right corner for 2020 to 2100, so projecting it out. These, uh, these different scenarios range from a low of one foot of global sea level rise by 2100 to a high of almost eight feet here in Honolulu. The greatest sources of variability are time in the scenario, although those patterns vary spatially due to various processes through, such as thermal expansion and subsidence. Um, finally, on that, that photo was taken during a large wave event in February of 2022 and shows a residence on Oahu, Hawaii that collapsed due to coastal erosion. Temperature and heat is another major variable that we track. Temperatures have risen significantly in Honolulu, as shown in that graph on the top right. The number of hot days has increased and new in the National Climate Assessment. This year, we have more information on how this impacts human health. Uh, this figure on the bottom shows a community heat assessment that was done by the Honolulu Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency on Oahu in 2019. Um, so this happened to be a day that tied the hottest temperature ever recorded in Honolulu and multiple communities had heat index values over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Extreme heat is going to continue putting communities at risk. Um, as we all have experienced, increasingly severe droughts and warming are increasing wildfire risk. This figure from our chapter is based on a new paper by Clay Trauernicht and his team and shows how the annual percentage of total land area burned for seven Pacific islands is equivalent to or greater than the percent area burned for all Western United US states. To avoid future catastrophes like what we experienced in Maui this past summer, there are many management actions we can use to reduce fire risk. So the future of fire is highly sensitive to management and policy decisions. This is the other half of our conceptual diagram, highlighting how these changes translate into impacts on our ecosystems and the places where we live. For example, more intense and frequent heat waves, impacts to water supplies, salinization and saltwater intrusion on our low and high islands. Um, so these led directly to developing our five key messages and topic areas, which are, uh, we wanted to focus on how climate change impacts people. So our chapter's five key messages, which were chosen by communities across our region, are about uh, water and food, human health, built environment, livelihoods, and economy, ecosystems and biodiversity, and cultural and historical resources. Although there are parts of these messages that go across all of the, the key messages and the chapter. We'll be using these key messages to break out into groups later this morning to help inform the state's comprehensive climate action plan. And now I'm going to go um, into some details in the ways that we're already experiencing these impacts, some of the future risks and adaptation strategies that are underway. Climate change impairs access to healthy food and water. Climate change undermines sustain sustainability of water supplies and deteriorates water quality. On low-lying atolls, for example, we have high confidence that sea level rise has already caused saltwater contamination. Past and ongoing disposal of military, industrial, agricultural, and municipal waste contaminates island water supplies. Drought, associated fires, and flooding all impact interact to exacerbate sediment loading to streams. We also have seen that climate change is and will continue to disrupt food systems in Hawaii and across the islands. Islands are often at the end, the end of the fragile supply chains as we've all experienced during the pandemic. Climate change is going to increasingly impact food production, transport, processing, packaging, storage, retail, consumption, and waste, all parts of that cycle. Um, this ex emphasis on food security is actually fairly new in NCA5. Uh, you'll see this repeated throughout our key message. Um, but access to clean, fresh water and healthy food is expected to be increasingly impaired by climate change. Um, and as we have seen, climate uh, Pacific communities have increasingly relied on imported foods, which come with complex and sudden, sometimes hidden environmental, financial, social, cultural, and nutritional costs. Disruptions to agriculture will continue to occur. Warmer nighttime temperatures and saltwater intrusion, especially in 
Pacific island states, such as Federated States of Micronesia and the Marshall Islands, are project projected to increase damage from disease on staple crops, such as taro, bananas, and breadfruit. However, adaptation actions, such as traditional farming, fishing, and land management practices can help build more resilient water and food systems. Our next key message is about health. Climate change undermines human health, but community strength boosts resilience. This key message is new in NCA5. As five years ago, there was not enough literature for us to assess to really include it in uh, the chapter. The overarching message here is that climate change under undermines the place-based foundations of human health and well-being in the Pacific Islands. Extreme events, for example, have direct health and safety impacts, and these impacts persist long beyond the initial disaster. Long-term impacts, such as unsafe drinking water due to drought and healthy and safe health and safety consequences of wildfires particularly affect disadvantaged groups. Uh, shocks and stressors also com compromise healthcare services across the region. And this figure actually shows after effects from Super Typhoon U2, which struck the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands in 2018 um, and ended up damaging a lot of the island's critical infrastructure. And that uh, event really underscores how events such as cyclones, flooding, and droughts combine with societal factors to affect human health and safety. We also assessed how climate change impacts uh, human mental health. Mental health consequences from climate Im impacts are affecting people broadly across the region, but especially rural populations and other disadvantaged groups. Human migration will increase due to sea level rise driven inundation and salinization, but more studies are needed about how to prepare for impacts on mental health. Outbreaks of mosquito-borne diseases such as dengue, chikungunya, and Zika are increasing in frequency, extent, and duration. Adaptation efforts that build upon existing community strengths and center local and indigenous knowledge systems have great potential to boost resilience. Key message three focuses on sea level rise. Climate change, particularly sea level rise, will continue to negatively impact the built environment and will harm numerous sectors of the island's economies. Rising sea levels are increasing the frequency and magnitude of coastal flooding events as seen in these photos. Rising sea levels threaten infrastructure and local economies and exacerbate existing inequities. In Hawaii, sea level rise will affect numerous cultural sites, roads, structures, homes, military bases, and more. Hawaii has enacted forward-looking state and county policies, including increased minimum setbacks and setbacks that incorporate science-based erosion rates and a first-in-the-nation mandate to disclose sea level rise hazards prior to real estate transactions, among others. The costs of adapting to mitigating and suffering the consequences of climate change will increase over time, but could be up to 3 to 13% of GDP by 2100. These economics values will vary by sector. But climate sensitive industries such as fisheries and agriculture are particularly vulnerable. This image is another art and climate submission that calls for action. The artist's statement um, illustrates how the Kainui structure failure illustrates the complexity of coastal climate politics. The owners are native Hawaiians who have kept the building in the family for five generations. Receding coastlines will force reckoning not only with issues of historical indigenous exploitation and wealth concentration, but also community, individual, and state's rights. Without a coastal action plan, property owners in Hawaii may rely on illegal courses of action when responding to catastrophes. Think about that going into the networking session later. Um, we also highlight the different goals uh, that islands across the region have committed to for 100% renewable energy um, and carbon neutrality, as well as highlight some examples of islands that have made impressive progress so far, including Guam and Hawaii establishing 100% renewable portfolio standards for the electricity sector by 2045, Palau by 2032, and RMI pledging carbon neutrality by 2050. In 2016, the uh, American Samoan island of Ta'u transitioned from 100% diesel to 100% solar. And Kauai's grid achieved a 69% renewable portfolio in 2021 and is occasionally 100% renewably powered during midday hours. This key message is divided into both marine, coastal, and terrestrial and high island ecosystems and focuses on uh, responses to rising threats from climate may help safeguard tropical ecosystems and diversity. 
Ocean changes are projected to impact the structure and composition of marine ecosystems. This includes biomass declines of various species, shifts in species across the region, more frequent and severe coral bleaching events, and impacts on different types of wildlife. High island ecosystems are highly impacted as well. Um, and um, due to uh, due to these due to these uh, uh, climate impacts, um, the economic costs of species invasions are likely underestimated, as are the impacts of invasion on cultural service and familial relationships. Um, a lot of these high island ecosystems are some of the most vulnerable in Hawaii and are at risk due to invasive species, habitat destruction, intensifying fire and drought. Um, rainfall changes are also going to impact these aquatic ecosystems. Um, also, uh, the urgency of conservation actions is exemplified by the Hawaiian forest bird crisis. Forest bird populations are declining through to, due to avian malaria spread driven by warming. Managers are exploring options for safeguarding species that are near extinction, including habitat restoration, avian malaria vector control, and translocation. Conservation efforts increasingly involve broader partnerships with educators, indigenous knowledge holders, and others who play a vital role in conservation planning and implementation. Um, finally, our last key message focuses on indigenous peoples of the Pacific Islands and their knowledge systems, which are central to the resilience of island communities amidst the changing climate. Indigenous peoples are in identifying and quantifying the potential loss and migration of critical resources and expanding the cultivation of traditional food crops on high islands. Communities grounded in traditional knowledge continue to adapt to global changes as their ancestors have for millennia. Cultural and historical sites representing ancestral knowledge are being impacted um, and communities are assessing how to conserve uh, these cultural sites and um, the impacts that they are seeing, um, integrating these into restoration plans and mitigation of critical resources into the future. Communities are working to ensure that traditional knowledge is central to resilient strategies via indigenous knowledge systems and values of ecosystem services. This can include equitable outcomes from climate research and planning, uh, which are predicated on properly citing indigenous elders and knowledge keepers, enhancing indigenous control of data via data sovereignty, protecting intellectual property rights, and establishing free, prior, and informed consent. Lastly, the hundreds of references in the chapter show that across Hawaii and the Pacific Islands, adaptation and mitigation actions are already underway, but need to be accelerated and scaled up. Um, one of the ways that different islands across the region are doing this is by participating in tracking sustainable de development goals. Um, as part of a place-based path towards climate resilience, um, including piloting SDG dashboards to track, track progress, um, which was a question earlier about how we're looking at tracking pro progress in a place-based way. However, opportunities do exist for place-based adaptation and mitigation informed by indigenous knowledge systems. And again, here's our citation um, and our uh, link to the chapter. I encourage everyone to go check it out. Here are all of our technical contributors' names that you can't see, <laughs> and our chapter names, which you can also barely see. There are just too many people involved. Um, but thank you, everyone, for your time. And I hope you're, that got your, uh, your brains going and you're ready to move this into comprehensive action in the next session. Thanks. Oh, not the next section. Just kidding. Um, so now we're moving into the panel with authors. Um, so our moderator today for this panel, at this point, I'd like to invite all of the National Climate Assessment authors up who are here in the room today. Come take a seat at the table. We have name plaques for you somewhere. Oh, they're on the seats. Okay, so find, find your name, uh, name tag on the, on the seats and have a seat. And Heather, um, Heather Kirkering will, uh, will be moderating the panel discussion today. And Heather is from the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen.
Aloha, Kakao. Good to see you. Um, I am honored to be here moderating this esteemed panel today. As uh, Victoria mentioned, my name is Heather Kirkering. I'm with the USGS Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. I'm the deputy director. I was a technical contributor to the climate assessment, um, but today I'm standing in for the um, USGS PICAS director, Dr. Mary Vaughn Johnson, who served as the coordinating, the federal coordinating lead author, and she sends her regrets, but we'll be sure to listen in and follow up. And again, it's truly an honor to be here with the panelists. Each one contributed many years, as you've heard in a lot of time, um, and their shared expertise to complete the Hawaii and Pacific Islands chapters. Um, what we're going to do now is just go down the panel and have each of them introduce themselves by sharing their name, affiliation, and area of expertise or section of the climate chapter that they contributed to. Um, so we can start with you. We <laughs> Introduce yourself again. <laughs> are these, these are already on. Um, hi, everyone. You've already heard from me, Victoria Keener. And um, I've worked on two climate assessments now, and um, this time I was most active in the um, climate and human health section of the report. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Christian Giardina. I was a technical contributor to NCA4, and then for NCA5, I contributed to the ecosystem section. And I'm with the USDA Forest Service. Hello, hi everyone. Zina Zrekni. I'm a research professor, a researcher, sorry, at Arizona State University, ASU, as well as a co-investigator with Pacific Risa, and I contributed most to the human health and climate change section of the NCA. Um, Elisa Lustig, U.S. Global Change Research Program. Um, I was not an author, but was the uh, sort of liaison between the author team and our Global Change Research Program office. Um, I'm currently with Hawaii Nuiakea School of Hawaiian Knowledge here at UH Manoa. I'm from the island of Hawaii and I contributed to the key message on indigenous knowledge. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Olson. I'm a professor of ecological economics here at UH Manoa in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management. Um, I contributed to a number of the uh, different sections on health, built environment, and food and water. Hi, everyone. My name is Richard Lothrop. Uh, I'm a, a professor at the law school across the street here at UH, where I serve as a co-director of the Environmental Law Program. I work primarily on the built environment section of the NCA chapter. Hi, I'm Phoebe Woodworth Jeffcoats. I'm a research oceanographer and a NOAA Fisheries Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center way out on Port Island at Pearl Harbor. Um, I contributed a little bit to the food security section from the fisheries perspective and then to certain ecosystems. So. Thank you, panelists, for taking the time to introduce yourselves. And I should have probably said before, this is an opportunity for all of the audience to be able to ask questions, um, maybe things that have generated in your mind since you've been um, hearing the presentations and the speakers. Um, so we're gonna have a chance to ask questions to the, all of the panelists, or if you have a specific person that you'd like to ask a question to, um, to take the next half hour or so uh, to get through any of those that you might have. So to kick us off, um, I'll just start with some questions while you kind of think of maybe some in your mind and then we'll go around the room and, and pass the mic around for, for questions. Um, Maybe just for like the uh, the first four to start out with from me going down is uh, what in working with the um, Hawaii and Pacific Islands chapters this year, was there anything surprising or new to you um, that you learned about the climate in our region or what was missing or new messages? I'll start really quickly, although um, I, I don't wanna take too much time, too much of me speaking already. Um, one of the things that I was really surprised about and um, felt really good about was it's easy to become, um, you know, very negative working in the climate space um, over time, but there was so much positive stuff that happened across the region between um, the last National Climate Assessment, which was released in 2018, and this current one. There were so many initiatives counties, um, states, organizations moving forward with adaptation and mitigation projects. Um, there was so much more literature to access, uh, 
there were so many more findings that were relevant and really um, highlighted the great adaptation options um, that we're pursuing in the region. So I was really happy to um, assess those. Yeah, that was kind of the, the surprise for me. So maybe I'll go to my second surprise. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I feel like I was very lucky to be a part of this process. And the biggest takeaway for me was how holistically we need to take the climate change crisis and how all of these sectors certainly had um, uh, issues and developments that were relevant for that sector, but how important it is for all these sectors to really come together and synergize to create solutions in this climate crisis. That was my big takeaway surprise. Well, Victoria mentioned already how human health was addressed as a key message for the first time in this, in this chapter. We couldn't do that. I was also an author in an MCA forum. We couldn't do that last time because of the lack of literature, the lack of documented health impacts uh, on climate change for the region as a whole. That has changed, so I was um, surprised twofold. One, um, that there was so many documented, um, so much documented evidence of climate change impacting human health from um, natural disasters that were prolonged or difficult to recover from, compromising our health services, creating mental health challenges that were long lasting even after disaster all the way to the spread um, and introduction of new vector borne diseases of climate. The other um, surprise was just how many um, responses there were to that. I think I can go back to Victoria's response. Um, and those responses um, that were shown to be effective tapped into locally, um, local community strengths already um, in so social cohesion, like we saw on the island of Hawaii following flood disaster there um, how the community really band together to provide health care services, mental health um, services, also um, witnessed recently in Lahaina um, for the Maui wildfires. So, um, and during the, the pandemic, um, as uh, Pacific Islander-led organizations really spearheaded a lot of the most um, helpful and innovative um, health responses <laughs> in that disaster. So I think um, there's a lot to draw on in terms of community strength, and we saw that documented well in experiences in the, in the literature. Um, I think I'd uh, talk about the data gaps box that, that Vicki mentioned in her presentation. Um, this kind of emerged from a collaborative discussion between the Caribbean chapter and the Pacific Islands chapter, and I was um, surprised, I guess, but mainly just delighted to uh, see that highlighted. And I pulled a quote um, from this chapter's box that says that missing data in both regions is representative of ongoing exclusion in data collection efforts and perpetuates historical social injustices that are reinforced by colonial and post-colonial governance systems. Um, environmental injustice and legacies of um, colonialism are something that actually come up across the report this time, and the report really does quite a bit to address environmental injustice in ways that perhaps haven't been as highlighted in the past. Um, I don't know if I'm surprised by that so much as just glad to see it um, featured to the extent that it is this time. Great, thank you. And don't worry, the other side, we'll, we'll <laughs> get some directed to you too, but I did wanna open it up um, to the audience too, to have an opportunity during this time to have your questions answered. Is there anyone out there that would like to ask a question of all the panelists or an individual? Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, Brandon Buchan from National Weather Service Pacific Region. Uh, historically, the Weather Service has had a longstanding contribution of providing weather data to you all. Um, you point out data gaps and issues. That'll be a big bullet point for me to try to improve as I start a new position. Um, but is there anything else that we could assist the National Weather Service with uh, future assessments? Is there anyone on the panel who would like to address that question? How can the National Weather Service more assist in the next assessment? In addition to the data gaps that you Went out. Thank you. 
I think it would be great to feature some of the, um, you know, the, the the network and the community of um, National Weather Service meteorologists in charge across the Pacific <laughs> Islands region. You know, I know there are monthly and more, probably more frequent check-ins um, where everybody's really working together to synthesize both the current weather conditions and future climate outlooks and kind of decide on um, outlooks to put out and management actions to take. And I think highlighting and raising up that kind of initiative could be um, something really nice to feature in a future in future reports. Um, so you know, kind of kind of highlighting the other things that National Weather Service does besides just collecting data and displaying data, which is a lot <laughs> already. Phoebe, did you have a response to that? Um, yeah, so one thing that was highlighted in the chapter and kind of touches on the data gaps is that some of the products that the Weather Service puts out for the mainland United States and North America aren't available even in the state of Hawaii, let alone elsewhere in the Pacific Islands region. So just making existing product products like rainfall maps and projections and bounce rail products like that available for the whole region would help with the analysis in the future. Great, thank you. I think I saw another hand up. Um, oh, there you are. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you all. Um, Katia Balasiano from the state's Office of Planning and Sustainable Development. I haven't had the chance to read the document yet or pieces of it, but I'm interested in uh, if you came across um, certain uh, recommendations or your, your thoughts on institutional structures that need to be addressed, in particularly regulatory structures that might um, uh, help us uh, make advancements on this issue? I'll take a shot. And yeah, thank you. Can correct me. So I'm not sure that any of that emerged as something that we included in the report, keeping in mind that we're looking at that four year period since the last NCA is actually less than four year period. Um, other than one which doesn't quite fit your question, but I think is where your question heads. And that is throughout the report, I think in almost every key message, there's a note that all of the responses to climate change, whether they're regulatory or otherwise, um, need to be place-based, need to be based on the particular traditions and customs of that particular place, need to look at the biocultural resources of that particular place. And I'm not sure that our regulatory structures in Hawaii were ever designed to do that. When I think about chapter 91 and whether or not it really, it really does that. Um, and so implicitly, I think we have I identified how we would change our regulatory structures, but we never bothered to say it. And so maybe now I'll have to make sure I say that more frequently in a way to answer any question. But that's, I think that's the right question we, we should all be thinking about. Thank you. Does anyone else from the panel want to address that? Thank you. Um, I have another question from the audience. And I'm sorry, if you can say your name and who you're with, that would be great. Aloha kako, oval na o he alani chang, pole pekavao hikulinui o hava iwa manoa. I'm a faculty here at UH Manoa he alani chang. Um, thank you very much for your report. Everything I'm I'm on board with everything I'm hearing. Um, I respectfully appreciate all the hours you folks have put into this, and um, I almost feel like there's nothing more we can contribute except. <laughs> I didn't hear it, and I'm I'm sure it's in your report. Maybe later, in in you know, if you had more time to present it, all of this is important work for us. Everything you've said is important. Place, space, involving traditional healers, and traditional ecological knowledge. I want to hear mentorship. I want to hear how this message, this the science that we're talking about, this community that we're talking about, is going to be sustainable beyond our five year meetings every every five years beyond this report, how are you investing, especially in our Pacific Islands? They need to come and, and get more training, and then we need to go there and, and, and see things and start listening and observing and being a part of it so we can move it forward. And, and maybe in five years when the next report comes out, you know something greater is, 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 is all here. And again, I, I go back to mentorship and partnerships and um, respect for all the different cultures involved. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone that wants to speak to 
using the um, NCA5 are applying it in a way that provides mentorship over the next few years. Um, that would be great. Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, as I sat um, and listened to our youth talk today, and then I, I was actually having a lot of those same, my Na'al was telling me, like, we need more of these kinds of mentorship, especially as they put the kahea out to, to be a part of the conversations and that we as, I guess now I'm a makua age, <laughs> a little older, um, having to make sure that we reach down to our opio and bring them into the conversations. Um, yeah, I I sat there and, you know, as, as we continue to honor Prince Kuhio, that was something that he really committed himself to, um, and especially a part of the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs. I think that's something that we try to incorporate, whether it's here at the university or in our community. Um, to me, the, the takeaway and how I connected to NCA5 is having these key messages, um, now what? You know, and I think a lot of the presentations kind of lead to that is that we as a community um, can use this report and can use this framework to take those next steps and to possibly lead that, next, that, that action step forward. And I think that's how I, um, why I continue to come back um, to Kako'o in this kind of work because I see it just being inspired in my own community. I feel like we each need to awamo that kuleana and take this kind of report and then move it forward in our community and with the next generation. And hopefully, um, yeah, if people are out there and wanting to partner on that kind of work, that's something that I love to do too. So, aloha. Uh, thank you. Can I make one more? Oh yes, thanks. Just quick one. Um, for, so tomorrow, um, I'll just make a make a um, advertisement for tomorrow, the second day of the climate conference. In the morning, the podcast will be hosting an emerging scientists for climate adaptation session mm -hmm. from nine to eleven. So you can come and see some of the great work that um, these these early career scholars are working on. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, yes, and then I see you. Oh, aloha. My name is Jody Chu. I am with the Forest Service. I'm in the background here. Um, so I wanted to um, pick up on a thread that my colleague, Christian Giardina, put out in the room about the interconnectivity. And I was curious, as there was a discussion about mental health and the effects of climate change on mental health, which likely also lead to physical physical health, right? Um, is there a conversation happening here amongst um, entities at like uh, the Burns School of Medicine? I see Richard, that you're here from the law school representation. I'm just curious, have we started that kind of dialogue here within our university system? That's a great question. I'll start it off and maybe others would like to add, but I would really encourage you to come to the networking session um, and participate. We do have, um, I believe, Dr. Sandra Chang from Jackson, from the Johnson School of Medicine, who is um, involved in One Health Initiative, kind of looking exactly at those interconnections between environment, climate health, mental and physical health, um, and well-being. And so, um, she may be able to share about what's going on. In general, the networking sessions are really to understand what kind of work is happening to address climate change in different areas um, along the lines of our key messages on health as one of those. Um, I would also um, just point out that this, the, the research um, on climate and mental health um, is more advanced perhaps um, and, and the dialogue in the Pacific Islands region as a whole. In Hawaii, I'm not as aware of the um, as much dialogue here, but um, there's well-documented evidence on feelings of distress and anxiety stemming from the loss or degradation of resources that are depended upon for cultural practice, for 
um, identity, for um, sense of community, and for livelihoods and and, um, and real practical uses that. So um, that's contained in our chapter, and I think more research is definitely needed for that in Hawaii and Hawaii based countries. I'm compelled to share a quick story because it's responsive. It's not in it's not in the NCI. It has nothing to do with the NCI. Other than uh, I'm sorry, a bigger theme here, and we acknowledge is that some of us are older than we really feel like we are. Uh, we should be listening to the youth, and it was the medical students and the law students about two years ago who decided to create a partnership between the two of them, and every year or so to put on some event where either medical students could hear from law professors or law, law students could hear from their med school professors. And so we've done one of those, and I expect the students will be conspiring to put one on again. Um, and I had nothing to do with that other than to say, that sounds like a wonderful idea. Uh, so it does happen if we just listen. And uh, maybe I'll just add to, because um, this is a personal a personal story. And so in NCA4, I talked about, um, I always get, sorry, emotional when I bring this up, but I talked about the impacts on salt making. Right? So recently we published a hydrology um, study that we did on how the impacts were um, on the salt practice. And I guess I bring this up because it had a personal impact on me as a co-PI on this project because I was being told by other um, scientists that the practice should move more up Malka. Mm -hmm. And in these conversations, I shared like, how do you tell me, a practitioner, to just move the practice? And we had a back and forth about, as a scientist, I need to make this recommendation. And I said, well, as a scientist, I say I cannot because the elements of my aina tell me we are here. We can only be here. If that's the case, we will be making salt all over Hawaii, not just in Anapete. And so I think I, I share that because I still deal with it, obviously. And um, I think that's probably a, a gap uh, and something we need to address as scientists that sit together in the room as community people. Um, and that's why I commit to doing this kind of work and to helping to have a key message that is specific around indigenous peoples, indigenous communities, and our um, resilience. And yeah, just um, I'm a hollow being able to work with friends here that can have that kind of understanding. I just wanna, I'm gonna add on for one second um, that I, when you're asking about what surprised us in, in the chapter, um, I'm a social scientist, an interdisciplinary scientist, and we really made this chapter about people and the impacts on people. Um, and so I think a lot of climate can be very cut and dry about hydrology, about the temperature, um, but really what's happening through people's experiences through, um, yeah, being told that they have to move their cultural practices, or they can't eat the fish that they've always eaten, um, is what makes it powerful and resonate um, and, and hopefully inspire the kind of climate adaptation that makes people's lives better at the end of the day. Because um, it's not just about um, thinking about the main song these days, right? Thank you, panel, for those thoughtful answers. And I know we have a question waiting right here for further notes. Aloha, Malia. Mahalo for your EK and your mana'o. And you've actually answered some of my question. Um, how was the experience uh, for you as a Native Hawaiian cultural practitioner? Not to put you on the spot, but um, and what do you see as the most major challenges or obstacles when incorporating indigenous knowledge into the design of responses to climate change impacts here in Hawaii? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, I'm lucky to have mentors like Mililani Chas. 
that have opened up pathways for me to travel um, and be a part of UN meetings and conversations. And it's actually there where I sat with many other indigenous Wahine women, and I heard from them um, saying, you know, that it, the solutions are there within our indigenous communities and our peoples. And this is maybe about 15, 20 years ago. Um, and since then, I've come home and I've looked for those solutions and I've been seeing them pop up left and right. I think before that, when I was a little younger, I I didn't really recognize them as those kinds of solutions and that all, that those answers are found within our communities. And so now I think as a practitioner, but also as a researcher, I think many of us have made those kinds of commitments to working with indigenous communities and, you know, like you talked about making sure that we bring in their free prior and informed consent from day one of creating a project um, to the follow-up and to that ongoing relationship that we build. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, like I, I, I think many of my colleagues are are supportive of sitting at the table, being invited to the table, being given that opportunity to, to have funding to do the work that we love that connects us to the Aina. Because I think, and we're gonna hear more from our Ohana from Lahaina, but I think you know we're seeing firsthand that we need to listen to those voices of our community and hear from their experiences um, in order to move forward in, and find those solutions. Mahalo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> May I quickly um, respond to the question that wasn't yep. addressed to me? Thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to share a quick story that, that is related to a question that doesn't quite answer it. I had the privilege to help uh, Malia and Hanani moderate the listening session we did with some experts on the cultural and historical resources section of the chapter. And the brilliant Rosie Alvado was there, had a lot to say. But one of the things she said that has really informed um, the way I'm reading some of the information that comes out of this report and lots of other things that, that are happening. She said, you know, it's great that people are finally starting to document and understand the value of traditional and customary practices in response to things like climate change. But don't ever mistake that for expecting indigenous communities to solve the problem that has been created by others. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very important warning that those of us who are not practitioners of traditional and customary practices should take to heart. And, and that's why I felt compelled to jump in and I'm sorry for, for, for doing that, but it was just such, such a useful piece of advice to me, a, a brilliant framing of, of sort of how what the pathway looks like that I felt compelled to share. I also, I recognize you asked a question earlier that never got answered about how, how was the doctrine of free prior informed consent sort of incorporated into here. And so quickly, I'd like to say, in part, it wasn't because this cannot be policy prescriptive. The law doesn't allow it to be. So we can't say that you must go and get free prior informed consent. Nonetheless, Hanani and Malia, as uh, sensible authors, in what is nearly the very last line of the document, um, did point out that equitable outcomes from climate research and planning are predicated on properly citing indigenous elders and knowledge keepers. There's a lot of dot, dot, dots for, for time I'll skip through. The last part of it is, and establishing free prior informed consent. So like most things in this chapter, Eliza forced us to take that huge ideas, condense them to one sentence. I love it when we did that there and, and acknowledge the doctrine. Thank you, panel. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Oh, okay. So um, I'm, I'm Sandra Chang. I'm from Jabsom and from UH Manoa. And I just wanted to comment and maybe request your cooperation because 
getting back to the comments of you know what is going on in this community in trying to respond to the needs that we have relating to climate change. Uh, one is, yes, I am the director of the One Health program at UH Manoa that is reaching out to undergraduates and uh, different members of the university community to address questions in One Health. So we're very interested in the NCF A5 document and using it for as a learning tool for this community. Um, but in addition to that, I wanted to bring up one more community group and that is the um, climate change and health uh, work group that has been set up. That is a community group um, initiated by the Hawaii Department of Health that is drawing from many, many different um, members of the community working in different areas, including mental health and um, environmental science, trying to bring everyone together to address these huge problems that we have. So just you know, one more ray of hope that there is within the community um, groups of people getting together trying to address these questions. And hopefully we can do this in partnership with NCA5. Thank you. Anybody have a comment toward that comment? <laughs> Thanks. Um, and this will be the final question. I'm sad this is going so quickly. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jay Matt. I'm an independent journalist. Um, and I have, as often I do, a question about communication. And I am wondering if there are plans to take the principal takeaways from this document out into the community in more popular manners than these kind of events or even the young scientists thing coming up. Um, does this group here for this place for Hawaii have a plan for dissemination out into the world that so badly needs it? Thank you. I mean, I can, I can say that we certainly, as an instructor of courses for undergraduate and graduate students, it's a, um, a resource to, to bring to bear to have um, all of this science distilled into uh, a chapter. Um, so certainly for some of the, the, the students at UH Manoa, it's, uh, it will be tapped into. Um, that's one line of communication. Um, I'd also say that uh, USGCRP hosted a webinar series following the release of the assessment and just wrapped up uh, recently, actually. Um, I don't remember the numbers for this chapter in particular, unless someone else does, but on average, we had like 200 people join each webinar, total uh, around 15,000 people across the country. Um, that, talk about surprises. I was like, we had never done anything like that before. And so I was just really gratified to know that people wanted that kind of access to, you know, asking questions and hearing directly from our scientists authors. And so I think it's a thing that we want to think more about in the future of doing more even of that, because from the release time in November through March, we saw sustained interest in these web in this webinar series. And now it's free and open to the public. Um, and we had folks from all different kinds of places join. So I think it's something we'll want to think more about moving forward. Um, I'll also note that um, I think five or six of us uh, over the past month or so has, um, you know, by request, we worked with Joshua and the Maui mayor's office to go out and give some talks to both community and um, uh, county government and interested public. And so we've been, you know, um, we've been trying to get the message out where we can, but I'll just stress again that this is all, we're all volunteers on this um, with our time. We don't have any funding to take us places or, or so, you know, we're all been scraping together stuff to try and get it as far as we have so far. Um, and thank you to everybody who's, you know, still interested and whether you've been a partner or um, helping contribute funding to make this day and this week happen. But, you know, it's really, we're all scraping together both time and money to try and get the word out as much as, as we can. And there's no, um, there's no holistic outreach and communication. But please invite us to be a part of it. If you're organizing, a, you know, professional communicators out there, I think, I hope I speak for all of us and say that we're willing to, um, to speak to your audiences and to have you help us um, get the message out. And one last thing, each chapter has a designated media contact. 
Um, and so if you're ever, you know, if you ever do want, if you're not ever not sure who to get in touch with, um, our office is happy to be that central focal point and then we can help direct you. I'll share too that um, during Mahina Olalo Hawaii, which is our Hawaiian language month in February, um, Kawai Ola o Oha, the Oha newspaper invited me to submit an article and I translated our press release, which includes our five key messages. Um, in, I did it in Hawaiian. Um, and so that's available. Um, and it is, uh, I'm going to say it out loud so that I make it happen, but um, I will commit to translating our chapter into the Hawaiian language so that that can be shared in the community. Keep following the Leo, this is not, not a comfortable place to go. Uh, I, I've got two for you. Uh, one you'll find more satisfying than the other. On April 19th, the Environmental Law Program is putting together a climate reflection series, which uh, actually features our, our students who travel to the UN Climate Conference in order to do a reflection of what they experience. But our keynote speaker is Hanan Kane, one of the uh, authors on this chapter. And my hope, without yet confirming it with her, she'll say it again. Uh, <laughs> my hope is that essentially she'll talk about the key messages of, from the work she did here. So that's one way it gets out. The second way it gets out is that many of my students are actively involved in advocacy efforts, whether through our clinics or in their own individual capacities. And of course, this is now a resource. And they've been, I've, I've told them to use the traceable account section. You can find them, the best one-liners everywhere about sort of, we are very confident, <laughs> gosh, X is happening. And it becomes a very good way to get the, to get the message out in ways that become really policy relevant, right? Because they're in the role of advocating for specific outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll add just a couple more. Um, so there are adjacent organizations that are certainly keyed into this entire process. So for example, the Pacific Got Knowledge Exchange that a number of folks in this room are involved in. There's new uh, climate change extension capacity at Sea Grant and at our land grant. And so I think there's a growing network of people who are prepared to communicate the work that came out of this um, amazing document uh, into that next uh, layer of people who, who want to hear the the, um, the key messages, and maybe we're not directly involved in that, but there is downstream uh, passing on of that information, which is really exciting. Thank you, panelists. Um, unfortunately, we have to close this part of the morning and um, with the panel panelists, and I really want to ask you to give another round of applause to the authors and the people who help coordinate the NCA5 all the hard work they voluntarily put into it. Um, and I was going to ask the latter half of the, the group over here from my side uh, about, you know, um, how you hope to put it into action. And sorry, we didn't have time for that. But I think we had a lot of great knowledge exchange and answers to that question about how the um, assessment can be used. So thank you for your thoughtful questions. Also, panelists, thank you for your time. Thanks, Heather. Well, thank you, Heather, for stepping in. All right, please don't leave, everybody. Oh, uh, Krista wants to get a picture of everyone, so stay and, and look pretty, and I'll um, talk about the, the networking groups. Please don't leave. Please participate. This is the fun part um, where you get to break out and um, talk about how to take this into action, what goes into the state climate change action plan, um, how to implement these findings and key messages on the ground into policy. All right, one second. All right, so the instructions for the networking session are as follows. Um, you see these five tables around the room, um, each with a sign that announces the key message from the National Climate Assessment. Um, what we'd like everybody to do is pick um, either one or two uh, of these sections. And in the next, we'll do two 30 minute rounds, a little bit less now since we're tight, we'll have a, a uh, a timekeeper come over and tell everyone, maybe about 20 minutes per uh, per topic. And we'd like you um, to work with the authors at that table and a couple people that we've planted at each of um, at each of these discussions to really get to the next level of um, 
how to make these key messages actionable, um, take it to the State Climate Commission for their launching of the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan uh, this afternoon. So what are your top priorities for addressing the issues relevant to the topic um, that you're in and climate change? These can be community-led activities, organizations that you're working with, gaps that you see, um, more integration and holistic, you know, uh, unsiloing that's needed. This is your chance. Um, I'm going to synthesize it all over lunch and take it to the afternoon session and represent it back there. Um, and we'll keep on poking Leia and the commission to work with them to make sure everyone is represented. So at this point, I'll ask the authors who I see are already shaking out, the note takers and everybody in the room who has the time inclination to participate to break out. Um, and we'll have a timekeeper come out around about after 20 minutes to ask you to pick your second session. Thank you, go. Oh, um, I'll also note that we had um, we had this idea that we were going to give t-shirts out to people who asked questions, and then I forgot to announce it. Um, but we had great questions anyway. But if you asked a question, made a comment, go over to the corner near the
for sticking around. Um, just to entice you to stay through the whole session, there will be cookies at the break. Um, really, really grateful to um, have you folks all here. Um, we're gonna have some wonderful speakers um, from Lahaina join us. But first I, I did throw a little bit of a, a curveball to um, Chair Don Chang and, and asked her to come up and, and say a few words. We're really excited to have her here. So please join me in welcoming Don Chang. Aloha mai kako. And yes, this is this is very ad lib. So and I promise I won't take very much of your time. Um, and I had to leave early this morning. I had to run over to the um, Senate finance, uh, Senate WAM hearing. They were reviewing our budget. One year ago, we probably had a one, almost a one billion dollar surplus. This year, we've probably got a one billion dollar deficit. Um, so we are all trying to struggle to try to do the best that we can. But it is an honor for me to be here. Um, I am co-chair of the Climate Commission, Climate CCMAC. I like that so much better than I I for, I also lose. Um, now, what's our, what's, our, what's our name again? So I'm co-chair of the Climate Commission. It has been, um, you know, for me being a, I'm also the chair of the Board of Land and Natural Resources and the Commission on Water Resource Management. Um, it has been such an honor and privilege to be in that position. We have the opportunity to look at INA-based management collaboration, Malka Makai, looking at all the impacts that what, how do we protect our watersheds and so that all the water that runs out to the ocean, I was talking to Archie and he was telling me the story about Kahoma and how bringing back that fresh water has just, blossom the coral, that we have this opportunity that climate change is real. I think um, I think Red Hill, I also believe in Lahaina, has really, I think it has accentuated to all of us the vulnerability of our resources, that we no longer can just depend upon um, that water will be there or that the lands will be safe. Uh, climate change is impacting us to the point of we're seeing um, exponential um, shoreline erosion. We're also seeing um, mosquitoes going, the temperature is, is rising. What we thought our birds were protected, mosquitoes are now going up further in higher elevations, threatening these endangered species to the point where we are seeing um, there's very, very few left. So climate is real. Do not think otherwise. And I'm preaching to the choir. Everybody who's here feels the same way. I mean, I know we get it. But I think that um, the only way that we're going to do this is through this collaboration together. And DLNR, I see this in particular as one of our greatest opportunities is, is to work with partners like all of you who are here, as well as our other government partners, to really look at um, thinking of the, the young man um, the student Mason Fall, Mason. I mean, though that is the hope that we have is to, and we at DLNR are trying to create a career path for these younger generations. But I, again, I greatly appreciate all of you being here, sharing in um, Climate Week, trying to find other opportunities for us to collaborate. And I know you're gonna also be talking about the Climate Action Plan. What really excites me about that is that it is reflective of statewide but it's also being equitable. We're looking at how do we affect, in particular, communities that don't that get disproportionately impacted by climate change. So, once again, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak briefly to you, and continue on with Climate Week. Mahalo. Mahalo, Chair. Um, so our next session um, was really important for us to include this as a part of Climate Week because I think that uh, we've been really holding up Lahaina as, as the beacon of the urgency of the climate crisis. Um, and while we really do want to be respectful and thoughtful of you know the Lahaina community's um, pain 
that they've been experiencing um, over the past few months and will continue to experience. We also wanted to provide a, a venue. So, you know, when we invited um, Archie and Jackie to come join us today, we said, you know, this session is yours. So um, really excited to introduce Mel um, Swick, who is our new CC Mac uh, Outreach Specialist for Maui Nui, um, who will do introductions. Mahalo, Mel. Aloha, everyone. Um, I have to admit, I was really nervous to come up here today. Um, I told one of my friends recently how nervous I was, and he reminded me that public speaking is actually feared more than death itself in our population. And I reminded him that uh, death is inevitable, but public speaking is a choice. Um, <laughs> and actually, though, that is something I really want to speak towards because uh, I am the Maui Nui climate change and community specialist. And today I want to speak to the fact that it takes a lot of courage to speak about something that is bigger than yourself and to be a voice for a community that needs to be heard. Um, and so I am very honored to introduce two different Maui residents, but also uh, Lahaina community members and advocates. And they are Archie Kalepa and Jackie Keith. And Archie is a voyager, a surfer, a waterman, and of course the Lahaina community leader. And he is going to speak today, not only about his experience understanding climate change in his community, but also at a global scale and observed in real time. And then we have Jackie Keith, and she is a Lahaina community organizer and advocate. She's been focusing on legislation that can uh, focus on making sure that Lahaina recovery stays in Lahaina hands. And she believes that we can rebuild Lahaina as a transformative opportunity where we can champion sustainability and long-term innovation um, to make sure that these are principles that we focus on uh, and that we can kind of lead the state towards. Um, so the way this talk is going to be structured, we're going to have Archie go first and give his story, and then we'll have Jackie, and that will be followed up by question and uh, q and I guess. And then I want to make sure that we acknowledge the fact that it's a big deal to stand up here and be a voice for something bigger than yourself. So mahalo, I'm very grateful to have this community. And first I'll introduce Archie. Uh, aloha my kako everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna do two things. I prepared a talk. Um, and I'm also gonna share my life experiences with you. <clears throat> Never again. No community should have to go through what Maui has gone through, the devastating effects, lives lost, families displaced, and an economic crisis. The impacts are not limited to just land, but our beaches, our reefs, and our oceans. We have to prevent future climate crisis, like the Maui fires. With limited resources, <clears throat> we know the state must make hard decisions about its priorities during the legislative session. We feel compelled to let our government leaders know they must do everything possible to mitigate climate change and its effect on our lands and our Hawaii. It is our kuleana. It is our kuleana to do whatever we can to preserve and protect Hawaii's rich environmental contributions for future generations of Native Hawaiians and others in our state. It will only be a matter of time before we experience another disaster associated with climate change. As the saying goes, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. We cannot afford to have another disaster. As we continue to recognize climate change, change we hope 
Hawaii's lawmakers will help us make sense of the lessons we have learned and prioritize natural and cultural resources protection so that no one in our islands will have to experience what we have. This disaster has changed my life, has changed my family's life. But I'm gonna share something else with you. Indigenous knowledge is based around climate. The things that we know, feel, and touch for thousands of years is all about climate. I can say this for someone that is very intimate with nature. As a voyager on Hokalea, as a captain, as a navigator, it's not a, just about the stars. Really, it's that intimate relationship that you have with weather and its patterns. Being able to recognize the slightest change, being able to feel the slightest change. You cannot learn that in a classroom, but you can share that knowledge when you come home. We're proud to have relearned the ways of voyaging, navigating by being able to say we know how to sail to and from and back home. But what would that look like? What will that look like 50 years from now when our young navigators take the same journey? What will home look like for them? All of us that live in Hawaii, we have a sense of climate. We have a sense of understanding what climate change is because we live in it. We live on an island, we're surrounded by water. I've not heard of King's Tide. First time I heard that word King's Tide, I was like, what are they talking about? I live here my whole life. What are they talking about? Today, when I drive to my home in Lahaina, I see and feel King's Tide. This year, when we were supposed to sail to Tahiti, in the canoe, was off the coast of California. I asked Nainoa to bring the canoe home. He taught about it for two months and he called me and he said, Archie, we're bringing a canoe home. I said, you didn't have to tell me that. I already knew that was gonna happen. That canoe is the greatest classroom right now because everything is stripped away from you. Your lifeline, your lifeline is mother nature. That's how much attention you have to pay to mother nature, which is linked to the survival of you and your crew on that canoe. It is more pure, more alive than ever before on that canoe because we don't have the things to keep us safe other than the knowledge that we know about weather. We're in for a change. My home was a place. Kumihame, some of us know it as Thousand Peaks. The shoreline erosion that I've seen there this year alone. Sparked great interest. To what's coming. 
this year alone, I have seen intimate changes and in swells that I've never seen with that kind of strength coming from one direction. I have these conversations with Nainoa at least once a week about the changes that we see. There was a time when I became a father and I would put my two daughters to sleep. They're twins. I have a picture and they're this big in my hand. And I would put them to bed and I would ask myself, will they be okay? What I meant by will they be okay was what happened to Lahaina. Climate change. That's what I'm worried about for them. We live on an island. We see and feel the effects of climate change before anybody else. We understand it indirectly. We don't pay enough attention to it. We don't take it seriously enough. 15 years ago, I did not believe in climate change. When we did the Malama Honua voyage, it changed my life. My family owns a piece of land in Cahoma Valley. 12 years ago, I was asked to fight for the water. The stream was dry for 130 years. I said, no, I'm not going to fight for that water. You want to know why? Because I was afraid of going up against what I taught was greater people than me. That I would lose my family in the fight because that's how hard the commitment would be. The fight was a lot easier than I expected. We got the water back. When we got this water back, it was out of selfishness. What I thought was, I'm going to grow my family's taro. What I learned was a lifetime of experience. It's not about my family's taro patch. It's about what I saw happen and the transformations that happened in front of me. 12 years, watching the Oopu come back. Worrying if I'm killing the reef because the water is making its way to the ocean. The brackish water, spawning fish came back. In the last two years, I cannot believe what I've saw, seen. The reef is blossoming. Why? because of the cooler water temperatures. We all have industrial minds. When we see a water flowing in a stream from the mountain to the ocean, we see it as waste. That water can be used in better ways. The truth of the matter is, by allowing that stream to flow, you begin to take care of your aquifers all over again. You begin to create balance that once existed once indigenous people knew and understood and nobody listened to them. Now we have to listen to them more than ever because of climate change. They are the protectors. We are the protectors of climate change. Indigenous people, people that live on an island. This is preaching to the choir. But I'll say this, the love we all have for Hawaii is why we're here. What we have to protect, the kuleana, the responsibility that we have will not be easy. I don't know if you've ever heard my speech about the voyaging canoe. 
and the Hawaiian Star Compass. You own a house. The people that bring awareness to climate change owns a house in those 32 points of the Polynesian Compass. If you or anyone else fails to recognize that you own a house to keeping this canoe on its right heading, you're wrong. You own a house to that compass. We need people to listen to what you're saying. I'm listening. I own a part of that house. Why? Because I've been there. Why? Because I understand and I see. I'm not a professor. I do not have a college degree. But there's very few people that have spent more time in the deep, deep sea away from land than I have. That's where the knowledge is found to understand weather and its patterns, which gives me personally a greater understanding of climate change and how important that is to place, to my home, to my family, to my community, and to my island. Thank you. Aloha, my kako. Uh, my name is Jackie Keefe. Uh, I'm a Lahaina community member as well. Um, I'm a little more lucky than Uncle Archie since my home is in Nepali. So um, from day one, I've just kind of jumped in because I had the bandwidth, right? Um, so I want to start off by talking about hope. Um, I've been really blessed to be welcomed into the cir the circles that I have since the fire. Um, and I've learned, you know, I've, I've worked in hospitality pretty much the whole time I've lived in Hawaii. And so this is the first time that I've really had the chance to be in um, some of what are pretty exclusively Kanaka circles. And, you know, I've, I've gotten a few new mentors since the fire. And, you know, my first mentor was Amos Lono Kailua Hewitt. He was the battalion chief on the 2018 fire. Um, and, and he'd been basically gaslit for the past five years because when that fire happened, he said how grateful he was that the winds um, changed, that things happened the way that they did that day because the firemen were able to hold a line and the wind would change and then they'd be able to hold that new line. And after the fire, he told people that he was worried that if the winds had been different, we would have lost Lahaina. And everyone said, we could never lose Lahaina. That's never going to happen. Who do you think they're all calling now, right? Um, my second mentor that I had after the fire, his name was George Purdy. And he grew up farming Ulupalakua. Um, now he's a fireman. He's a fire lieutenant on Lanai. But he was also the first drone pilot to fly legally under FAA regulations. And he uses his drones in his firework, but also in his farming. So he piloted a agroforestry um, dry land ag program on Lanai where it was a hundred acres, him, one person, but he used his drones and he used these um, this technology called Groasis water boxes where it's a five gallon drum, has a wick at the bottom and it keeps the soil moist, right? Because the way he explained it to me, because I didn't know these things about the land before the fire. A lot of Kanaka have known and have been trying to share this information, but they haven't had the platform. And so what he explained to me is if you think about dead land versus alive soil, you have your alive soil is like a loaf of bread. You pour a cup of water on it, the bread soaks up the water, right? But if you treat if you think of the dead land as just untreated flour, 
and you pour the water on that, what happens? Well, that's why our reefs are dying because our land is dead. And so we don't have that absorption happening. So we have sediment runoff. And that's why Uncle Archie talked about the fact that we're restoring the stream flow has made it so that the oceans are healthier. Something else that I learned from Uncle George is that it doesn't matter. We can dump millions of dollars into fixing the oceans as we have, but the land, it starts with the land. That's why projects are Mauka to Makai, right? So having the inclusive, high perspective, you know, we have a tendency to, you know, everyone's in the, which I'm unpracticed at, um, control what you can control, right? So a lot of people are like, we can dump a bunch of funding into the ocean, let's work on this. Because land is private. It requires, gonna throw to what board member Chang said, collaboration, right? And so it's harder to address issues on the land than it is in the water. But if you just focus on the water, you're just gonna be doing that forever and stuck in a cycle, right? Um, so some of the things that I've learned from, from him, as well as my other many mentors that I've been so grateful to come across is Kuliana, it's not, it's, if you look at it as a burden, it's maybe not meant for you because Kuliana has to do with something that you feel attached to as well. It's Uncle Archie and restoring his tarot patches and restoring the, you know, way that the coral used to be, the way that we've been working on. And another thing that he alluded to as well, observation, right? Indigenous practices, you have a lot of the time. I had this with Uncle George when I was first learning about his farming practices. It's like, oh, well, how do you know like when it's time? Observation. There's no time. There's no set this is going to take two months, this is going to take X amount of time, because it relies on the powers of observation. And so you have to be connected, you have to be one with the land. That's why there are so many sayings in Hawaiian that connect this way. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say it in Hawaiian, because I don't have the phrase down correctly. But there's a common saying that we in our community keep going back to right now, the answers to our future lie in our past. And the reason I say this is because another man that I've learned from in this time, I met him probably the day or two after the fire, was Kaipo Kekona. And he is a Lahaina farmer. And he has been talking because he's been working on Kuia land and he's been working to restore that area. And he is the one that first started talking about some of these things to me. And he has said, if we build back the same way, which is what a lot of people want, you know, we can't change Lahaina, like Lahaina is historic and many other sayings like that. And he has said to me since the beginning, if we build back the same way, we learned nothing. And I think that's really important to think about because we do need to make changes. And we, we have gotten, again, observation. We have been able to see since the fire, there are some pumps, these injection wells, there are man-made structures that control our water that have burned. And since those have burned, we have seen some other water return the way that it's supposed to. We have the channel by Wyola Church is now flowing with water. We have, if you're familiar at all with Lahaina, every time there's a power outage, because happens plenty, there is um, a flood underneath 505 Front Street. And that's because the natural spring still flows there. So that's been full since the fire because the spring still runs. And so the fact that it was a it was a plan that Uncle Kamoku Kapu talks about a lot that he found from 1961, there had been a plan to um, preserve Lahaina as like a historical cultural site, and 
he speaks about Moka'ula because Moka'ula is, it's the Pico of Lahaina. And, you know, it's so, you know, that is our, our center of power, um, our heart. And Moka'ula used to be an island. And when they made the harbor, they dredged the harbor and they dumped that in to where that street, that canal used to be. And so over time it got filled. And so again, we've made lots of decisions over time that have gotten us in this place. And this saying that I came across recently that I loved was, um, I'm hopeful because humans created this world which means that humans have the ability to fix it. And so another thing that I wanna share from Uncle George, because the reason that he did his plan the way that he did for that agroforestry program is because he says, I don't want to stop climate change. I wanna reverse climate change. And I believe that if we're going to build back a better Lahaina, which we can use to be a model, not only for Maui and Hawaii, but the globe, not even, you know, just the US or like, it doesn't have to be limited. If we think big and we take big swings, we have the ability to make big changes. And the reason that, um, that Mel mentioned my uh, legislation background is because I've been working with my community to educate and engage people because, you know, specifically I was working kind of with um, Senate Bill 3381 because it was introduced by some of our kupuna and um, there was a lot of fear around it. And so we were just trying to get the community to engage on the topic to see, is there a way that we could make this a bill that the community could be proud of? And so, that's something that I want to continue to focus on is just keep people engaged because this is a moment where people are waking up and they're realizing that, you know, we, we in Lahaina, um, we have some of the worst turnout for voter registration in the state. And that's just people who are registered. It's like less than 30%. So in order to, encourage our legislators um, to be collaborative, we need to be collaborative as well. You know, I believe that our legislators need to work more closely with scientists and subject matter experts, but you know, it also needs to be between levels of government and that will make things more efficient. If you have one, you know, county government prioritizing something that doesn't match up with the state priority, then things aren't gonna go as smoothly as they could. And so I believe that's where the community engagement comes in. And um, a, a thing that I hear a lot is that you need the political will to make things happen. And I think that we're finally in a moment where that political will exists. And so, you know, I stand up here and I just ask you, if you're not registered to vote, please register to vote. If you are registered to vote, but you don't vote, please start doing that. Um, and every time you go to vote, take three friends with you, or, you know, when you register, bring people with you, you know, the, the more we can include each other, the more that our democracy will actually reflect what we want to see. And that's why people feel so disengaged because they feel unrepresented, but it's because there's not enough of us engaging. So it's kind of a, a hamster wheel that we're stuck in, right? Um, and so I just, the last thing that I wanna end with is, I was surprised that Uncle Archie didn't say it because it's one of my favorite things that he says where he talks about a sale plan because we need to be operating under the same sale plan. So, we really appreciate being invited here today so that we could be a part of the discussion because we know um, a big part of our community's upset is that so many decisions are made over here and they feel unincluded by it. And so we hope that we can move forward with a, a sale plan that we can develop together. And he always says, it's not my sale plan. It's, it's for all of us. And so I, I hope that 
well, that was a bad word because I was going to say, I hope that I've shared some hope with you today because it's conversations like this that allow me to be hopeful. And the fact that our community has said time and time again, after this awful thing that happened to our town, that they are hopeful because this is our one shot at as Uncle Keomoku likes to say, at pressing the reset button, because we have a chance to fix things, to fix Lahaina, to fix Hawaii, and to be a model for the globe. So thank you very much. We have some time for a Q&A, um, and I'll have Jackie and Archie um, sit down. Let's make sure the mics work for you both. Um, and we'll just take questions as they come. Hi, Steve. Press the button. Oh, nope, it's just. Hi, thank you so much. Um, and Archie, I've heard you you speak a couple of times now and every time it still gets me. And um, I appreciate all the stories that you're sharing. Um, I was interested in what, something you said, Jackie, about uh, like the streams returning even on the dry soil as something you observed post fire. And I just wondered with the, um, you know, wanting to bring back to consideration all the observation and knowledge of um the people that have been there forever like how are you what are you seeing now just from observing that is that you would want to point out post fire you know it hasn't been that long but i mean to see major um maybe some things but and then are you tracking it or in, incorporating it into places so um people are acknowledging the observations you're seeing into maybe all the different players that are trying to come and uh, you know, proposed research or ideas? Well, it's definitely complicated because um, most of the people who are doing the tracking are nonprofits. And so, you know, we've had a lot of times where, you know, like very early on, there were samples taken and then they sat in someone's fridge because the funding wasn't there to ship them off to the lab because the lab is on the mainland. And so you definitely have that. Um, and there are certainly people tracking, but another layer to it is that the um, in-stream flow standards that are usually uh, held are, um, he they are held in some places more than others. So I was recently out at Kapika Oluwalu, which is a new, uh, well, not so new, they've been there about four years now, but they're trying to restore that land and they have a river that flows through their property. But something that I didn't mention is that I don't know how many of you have learned this in some of the things that have come out since the fire, but Maui um, went a different direction after the plantation days and did not condemn our water systems like the other islands did. And so private corporations and private entities control more than 75% of our water resources. So Maui County actually only controls less than 25%. So um, in West Maui, yeah. Um, and so there is that layer to it as well. And so at Kipika, um, there was the people who control it above them um, were pulling too much water. And so the week that I was there, the level was significantly lower than the weeks previously. And I had asked her about their standards and if they were held, and she didn't believe that that specific stream was. Um, so it definitely complicates it, but if you wanna. Yeah, yeah so um, I'd like to answer your question from a, um, an indigenous perspective as well. Is one of the things that we saw when um, after the fire looking at areas and in specific is uh, Moku'ula and, uh, and, and that area was that stream that she's talking about was always dry. It was um, 
now that thing is three feet high. So if we were to dig in Mokuula three feet down, we'd hit the water base. And as I was sh uh, sharing with Dawn, I think that will be um, the temperature gauge or the um, thermometer of the amount of water we can have in back in Lahaina. I think Mokuhimia and Mokuula will definitely um, be that place. At one time, it was said that Lahaina was the Venice of Hawaii, the amount of water that was there. So if we can bring that water back to Mokuula, I think that is our biggest aquifer in, in Lahaina. We bring that back, it can help um, all of Lahaina. So I think that's something that's really important. And, um, you know, the proof is in the pudding. You go down there, you walk down there. Uh, for those of us that have been watching it every single day for our entire life, we know what we're talking about. Come, you see, and we can show you the changes that are coming back. And I'll give you an example. Um, Goodfellows was awarded the contract to clean up the commercial properties. They had asked me to come with them and look at a possible site um, as a holding area for their materials. And um, we went to this particular site and it was an open field. And I said, and do you know what this is? And they, they said, no, but it's dry, it's perfect. And I said, look in that corner. Everything around here, look, everything is dry. Look in that corner, everything's green right there. I said, that right there, it's the water that's going back to Mokuula. And they were like, wow, you're right. And, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that um, people got to respect when it comes to local knowledge. I don't know the history of this place, but I know the history of my place um, that was fed to me by my grandfather, my father, by, you know, on both sides. But these are the kinds of things that we got to take into consideration, um, local knowledge, and it's there. Um, so my belief is that if we can return Mokuula and Mokuhimia back to its original state, it will be able to take care of Lahaina and its water resources, if that makes sense. Thank you for being here and sharing your perspective and your experience stories of what we can do. And it may be too early to ask, but um, I came here to hear you today because I live in Montauk. Mm -hmm. It's very much like we only have one way in and one way out. And I have, I'm an artist. I observe. I've been observing my entire life. <laughs> but right now, my canal is backed up, and we're seeing pockets of water coming up across from one of the restaurants. And a few years ago, the fire truck was stuck there for a couple of days. I mean, I think there's it, it's not what we see on on the surface. It's what's happening underneath. And so I'm very, very interested in learning from you about what can we do to keep water up on the ridge. Um, because I know you had firemen who saved this property by making it so there were um, there was water that he could fight the fire with, mm -hmm. um, and, and things like that. And I just really hope you you share that. And I really want to know, as a navigator, from what you've seen, what do we need to do right now to be prepared for the tsunami that we're going to go on? And it may be too early for you to even say, and I understand that. Um, but one day we need to know because it's happening quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I'm going to share this. I don't know if we're running out of time, but we need cloud catchers. When I say cloud catchers, we need trees that will go tall and fast, which will turn into cloud catchers that will catch the rain, will bring rain. Um, so resilience as she talked about uh, Kaipo Kekona and the project that he's undertaking to reforest um, 
our higher elevations or our lower elevations going into the higher elevations and what that's going to look like for the resilience of Lahaina is super important. And I think it's something that all of us have to look at in our own backyard um, because where you live in those, those mountains over there, um, you don't have enough um, rain caps, which um, is important. You know, I've, I've seen a, and I cannot find this um, documentary. There was a guy, he, um, he owned, he started from nowhere in Africa. He became um, the head henchman of an oil company, owned his own, um, and he started from the very bottom. He gave it all up, bought a land and piece of land in the middle of nowhere, planted trees, built a bridge before there was any rain, and everybody said he was crazy. One day the rain came. Today, he his kids hated him because he invited all these um, homeless kids. Today, 200 kids a year graduate from college from him. And um, he today provides one of the biggest um, agricultural um, vegetable farms to all of Africa. He bought a place in the middle of the desert planted these trees, and that's what we need to do in Hawaii. We need to start looking at a more resilient Hawaii. As, you know, 30 years ago, land was the most valuable thing. When you were growing up, did you ever think you're going to pay for a bottle of water? No. Today, in Hawaii, water is more valuable than land. That is very scary. So we have to find ways to maintain and make sure that water keeps coming. And it's about planting a forest, which in turn will protect us from fires, but more importantly, more importantly, long-term, create a resilience that will allow us to live on an island for a very, very, very long time. That's how important it is. And it's also important that they're native, right? Because I don't know about over here, but if you look up Malka when you're on the Lahaina side, most of those trees are invasive. So invasive trees are water suckers. They're, they're terrible brush for fires, but they also have destroyed our water table, right? They've been part of that dead land that I was referencing. And so making sure, especially when you're working on reforestation, starting with the low water trees. So the ones that George always says is Ulu, Milo, and Kakui are the ones you start with and you need your cover crop. But I think it's also important to remember that part of the Venice of the Pacific was that the Ulu was so thick, the Ulu grove was so thick that they had to sail out from Lahaina to see what the weather was like. Like that's crazy. If any of you have been to Lahaina in the past century plus, that's not how it is, right? And so again, looking to the past to see the answers for our future. Mahalo, I think we have time for one more question. Mm. Okay, we'll take these two if they can both make them quick. Aloha, my name is Chanel. Um, thank you very much for sharing your story. And um, there's a lot that we can learn from the discussion. So thank you. Um, we are learning that all of these climate change matters are related and we can't look at them independently. And you gave a good example with stream restoration impacted coral reef health, but also with the fires, we know that you know native species planting and reforestation has impacts on decreasing invasive grasses that are a huge factor in wildfire behavior. So we know that all of this is connected, right? And the knowledge is out there, but often the people that are in those kind of realms are siloed, right? People who are focused on tree canopy aren't always talking to people doing stream restoration. So, and we know that um, we need greater communication between those different teams. 
Um, but importantly, that communication and engagement that reflects the needs of the community and of the local people. So I guess what I'm kind of trying to ask is, what does that engagement look like? But also, how do we get those people talking? Because we know that it's not just one that can do this huge task. We need everyone from these different experiences and backgrounds talking together and in the room together. So just kind of your experience in um, facilitating that. Well, it took the line of fire for us to realize that in our own backyard. And what I'm going to say is we have to begin to make those connections. It's important to have those conversations because I think um, each group thinks that they're more important than the other, maybe. Uh, but what we've come to realize is we need each other. I need the people planting the trees to help my stream. I need the people planting the trees or the stream to help the people planting the trees. It, it goes hand in hand. Climate change is connected to every part of this earth. Everything that happens, every small step we take to um, mitigate climate change, everybody has a role, everybody has a part to play and it's all connected. And so begin that conversation with those groups and um, have them understand that it's important for you to support them and them to support you for the succession of what you're all trying to accomplish. And I think, um, you know, if, if you think about who's in power, right? Um, I'm just one person but every time I testify on certain bills that have to do with, oh, we think that we should give, like there's been a lot of, we should fund DLNR to do X project, but like many or most of our departments in this state, everybody is short staffed, right? So if you continue to make these decisions and say, okay, we're gonna fund this project here. For example, there's one that it's like, oh, we're gonna, we think that they should start a um, plant nursery and seed bank program. And my testimony consistently has been, what you need to do is provide that funding to the nonprofits that are already doing the work because they can do it more efficiently and they know how to do it. And so it, I think takes us using our voice towards those in power but also I think if we, I have started to see for sure nonprofits starting to understand what you're saying. And so I think they really have started to try to work together. I was at a dune planting a couple of weeks ago that Mackay Watch was there and Maui Housing Huey was there um, and Resiliency Huey was there. And like, so people are really, especially on Maui, you know, starting to understand the importance of collaboration. I mean, it's a word we've said a lot today, right? Um, and so I think that us as citizens, the more that we can push on that to those in power, um, the, the better off we will be because a lot of what we can do is use our voice, right? Like you need to vote, but that's the bare minimum of being an engaged citizen, right? So that's, that's my mind on that. Uh, thank you, I uh, enjoyed your talk. Uh, this uh, question, I guess, is uh, more for Uncle you said something in your talk that uh, really uh, struck a point with me and that I wanted to get more insight on. You said a few years ago, you did not believe in climate change. And I've observed this in many different places. You know, people arguing who's right, who's wrong, this exists, this does not exist. My question would be, I guess similar to hers, not just how can you get two groups working together towards the same thing, but how can you work with or around people that maybe have opposite views and how can you make that progress? How can you engage and begin those conversations when someone sometimes might push back and say, this isn't correct or you're wrong or this is not true? It's called Tung Fu. I'm <laughs> uh, just kidding. You know, I, um, this is the hard part. It's called sacrifice. Never giving up. People are quick to give up. And um, we all want the easy way in life. But good work never comes easy. 
you got to stick in the game and it's a lifetime. It's going to be a lifetime. Climate change will be a lifetime struggle. Not only for you, but for the ones that come behind you. But the more we become educated, the more we see and feel climate change, the more aware we become of it. The more we realize it's important. It is more important than ever. So, <clears throat> the only thing I can tell you is be lead by example. Just continue to um, work towards what you believe and how you need to educate others to be a part of accepting climate change and how everybody needs to play a part in, in making it happen. Because it is happening. Climate change is, it is happening, but we are winning against time. But um, we're on the treadmill and uh, we're running in place right now versus moving backwards. So the more people we get, the sooner we can begin to move forward. We're just running in place right now because people are aware of climate change, what's happening, everybody's paying attention globally. And uh, this circle of people that are fighting for climate change is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. This is testament to that. It's just gotta keep growing. Yeah, I think the most basic thing that you can do is just continue to engage in this conversation. You know, the, at a fundamental level, keep trying to have these discussions with people because the one person that you're trying to talk to about it might not, it, it, it might take multiple times to even get them to engage in the conversation, but somebody else in that circle will hear what you say because they are also interested. And so you'll be able to have the discussion with them and that's how you build circles, right? And so, as he said, you know, that's how we grow our circle is just continue to engage in the discussion. It's all you can really do for now. And so the more we do it, the better off we are. Mahalo. If you can all join me in having a big mahalo for Uncle Archie and Jackie. Um, now we're going to take a short little break. I think um, we're a little behind schedule, but that's okay. We'll come back at 2.45. Um, in, when we come back, we actually will be tackling some of those questions that were brought forward by you folks in the audience. So please stick around. Um, we're going to learn a little bit more about the state's climate action planning and how we can all be under the same sail. Mahalo.
here. Um, I think, you know, our, our talk from Uncle Archie and, and Jackie really teed up us up really, really well um, because, you know, they, they spoke about, you know, all being under the same sail. And that's really what we're, we're going to do our best to make happen here. Um, again, for those of you who's just joined us, I'm Leah Laramie. I am the Climate Change Coordinator for the State of Hawaii with the Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission, better known as CCMAC. Um, and I'm joined up here with, with Udi and, and Victoria, and, and we did a little switcherooskies on our um, agenda, um, largely because we just thought the, the flow was a little bit better. We had an opportunity to do some workshops with you folks. Um, on the National Climate Assessment, and we wanted to share out some of the results from that. But we wanted to give you a little bit more context on, you know, how we're going to use that. Because I know a lot of times we come to these conferences and do th these little tidbits, and then where does that information go? So I just wanted to to, to share a little bit more about how we're going to incorporate that um, and kind of the, the larger picture of the work that we're trying to do. Um, so just giving us a bit of context. Um, Hawaii has been a global leader. And when I say global leader, I truly, truly mean it. We have been a global leader um, in, in setting climate goals. Um, we have a number of goals, some which we have um, achieved ahead of time, such as our renewable energy portfolio. Um, we've already hit our goal nine years ahead of schedule there. Um, and some that are gonna be really extremely challenging to reach. Um, and that's our um, goal to sequester more carbon than admitted. Um, just in 2002, there was the, the new target set by 2030 to have reached 50% of that um, with the final goal in 2045. Um, what, we, what we're seeing um, with our greenhouse gas inventory, that if we continue with business as usual, and that, that includes all the actions that we have in place, you know, the planned um, solar energy fields, the the planned um, uh, energy efficiency standards, we're not gonna meet it. We're, in, we're not even gonna meet it very close. So we can see here um, where we've gone from 1990 to, to 2019, which is the latest year of our inventory, where our emissions have, have gone. And it's been a pretty slow decline um, with even a little bit of, a, of an incline there. Um, you can see here 2020, we see a dip. That's because of the pandemic. Um, but we're expected to actually increase our emissions and then slowly go back down, but by no means meeting our 2045 goal. Um, the Hawaii State Energy Office uh, put together the decarbonization strategy, uh, which identified several different ways with which we can actually meet that goal. Um, you can see here this, this dashed line is how quickly we need to make those changes and how steeply we need to drop our emissions in order to meet our 2045 goal. And that's gonna really require us to make huge societal shifts and change the way that we operate and do things in order to make that happen. So, you know, I think we're, we're generally familiar with the impacts of, of climate change in Hawaii, especially those of us in the room here. Um, and one of the things that we're really trying to do is talk about this in a way that can relate to everyday people, people that don't work in this space. We're talking about, you know, the flooding that's happening due to sea level rise and the loss of our beaches, you know, something that is very ingrained into us who grew up here and us that live here. Um, you know, our beaches are our backyards. Um, you know, and, and also the eroding roads that are disconnecting our communities and making it not possible for us to reach our Ohana. We're also looking at, you know, with, with more and heavy rain or um, heavy rain events and then less rain, we're seeing the constant decline of um, rainfall over the past 30 years. It's going to increase our water bills and have higher prices for local food and make it harder for us to produce local food. We're looking at a loss of drinking water, like Uncle Archie said, you know, we're water is going to be one of our prime resources um, and we're losing it. We've already seen the increased risk for fire and we've seen the loss of important natural and cultural species. Um, there's been extinctions within my lifetime and there are projected to be additional ex extinctions. Um, 
And then with the flooding, it causes power outages, road closures and property damages. For some of us, we you know, have the insurance and the capacity to rebound from these. For many of our vulnerable communities, they just don't. If the roads are closed and they're not able to get to work, they're not getting paid. If their homes are damaged, they cannot afford to repair them. So these are really true, meaningful impacts. And we're just looking for ways to be able to communicate this to people so that we can express the urgency of climate change and take action. Again, you know, we talked more about the loss of coral reefs and limu, um, as well as our sea life, um, damages doing to hurricanes, um, and then, you know, just the increase in humid, muggy, and hot days. Um, we talked earlier today about uh, climate and health um, and how that was, you know, one of our um, big peak new additions into the NCA 5 Hawaii and Pacific chapters. And I think, um, you know, health is, is something that especially in the United States, is something that we don't have figured out yet. We don't have universal health care for people. And as climate changes, it's going to be more and more expensive for people to take care of themselves and to be resilient against it. So what does that all mean before I go into to who we are? Um, you know, that means that we have a lot of work to do. This a uh, climate action plan that we'll be working on is is not just looking at, you know, these impacts, heavy rain, drought, increased temperatures, but it's looking at everything that comes along with that and really understanding that climate change impacts everything we do and everything we do will impact climate change. So just to give you folks a little bit of context of who I am and the space that I work in, um, CC Mac. Um, we are a multi-jurisdictional commission. Um, we have 20 board uh, commission members. Um, we have um, our co-chairs, Don Chang and Mary Alice Evans from the Office of Planning and Sustainable Development. Um, and then we have 18 other members. Um, we have all four county planning departments, some of which are here today. Mahalo for joining us. Um, and we have um, for legislative representatives. I think this is really important and key that we have legislators in key agencies that um, are part of our conversation so that they can bring those messages back to the larger legislative um, branches. Um, and then we have various state op offices such as um, Department of Transportation. We know transportation is our largest emitting sector, so it's really important to have them there at the table to address you know, how they can deal with climate change, both you know, the mitigation and adaptation to it because they're really the ones that are most significantly impacted by sea level rise. Um, and you know, some of the actions that we've already taken have been great, um, not enough, but we're still, you know, we're, we're taking some actions here. So we're doing things such as protecting our drinking water through conserving watersheds. Our watershed partnerships are, you know, really held up as a model, um, again, worldwide model on how we can work together with private landowners, um, state landowners, federal landowners to work cross boundaries to conserve our, our watersheds and our local drinking water supply. Um, we're supporting local climate smart food production, um, both from the university and from the state side. I think tomorrow we're going to get an opportunity to talk a little bit of, uh, about our climate smart land manager assistance pilot program, which we just launched in 2022. Um, that's running through DLNR. Um, the state also has regulations for fleet electrification, um, energy efficiency incentives um, that are available to both um, you know, homeowners and renters. Um, there's a lot of incentives out there um, provided by our federal government that you know, we're working on making sure that those get out to our most disadvantaged communities because we know that energy efficiency is really one of our superheroes for working with climate change because it both saves people money and it reduces the burden on our energy sector. Um, Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority works on solar loans for, again, people who may be a little bit more challenged in getting qualified for those loans. Um, just at our movie showing, we had, um, um, Lisa Bishop share about the impacts that our um, policies on reef safe sunscreen had worldwide. Hawaii was the first, the first to pass a regulation on 
um, reef safe sunscreens and that snowballed into action across the Pacific worldwide and you know even stronger um, actions than, than we even had here but you know just to see us being a leader and in, in something that we're passionate about because we understand the interconnectedness of um, you know our reef systems and, and our ability to thrive in this area. Um, we've also worked on um, transportation choices. We have uh, some uh, great documents on that and, and just um, this session, another bill asking us to set goals for vehicle miles traveled reduction. Again, because transportation is our largest emission sector and we have a lot of renewable energy on the books. So there are a lot of actions happening across sectors and our goal is to see how we can leverage these actions already happening to build momentum and move even more quickly. So with that, um, I'm gonna invite Victoria up here to share out um, what we learned from folks this afternoon or this morning. Thanks Leah and thanks everyone for sticking around. So, um, as a result of this morning session talking about the Hawaii Pacific Islands chapter of the National Climate Assessment, we broke out into five groups um, corresponding to the key messages that we had in the chapter. And we had an hour of um, really rich discussions with a lot of smart people, many of whom are here in this room, with a lot of um, really deep experience about um, being on the ground in these communities, seeing what is needed, seeing what is um, happening, um, initiatives that are working, things that are not working, gaps where funding is needed. Um, and so as a, um, as a result of those, um, of those conversations, we were able to summarize through um, the great work of the note takers and um, the lunch hour, <laughs> those discussions into um, some key points for each topic that hopefully we'll be able to inform um, and build into a lot of these areas in the um, Comprehensive Climate Action Plan. So our first key message was about um, access to healthy food and water and the impacts of, from climate change. Um, so some of the key points from that discussion um, were the, uh, the benefits of having knowledge exchanges within communities on different topics, um, and the ability to learn from each other uh, in different contexts that make sense. So for example, um, whether something is ahupua'a based, so different ahupua'as learning from each other or um, a different topic or a different region, um, things like that. Also um, building up regional standing community hubs to build resiliency and trust um, around food and water. Um, and who that might be linked to, whether it's farmers in the agricultural community, um, perhaps that could link with the resilience hubs that are being stood up um, slowly around the state. Um, how to encourage the local food economy through both incentives and subsidies, and that there needs to be more push uh, to encourage the local food economy um, from the state. Um, the need to streamline processes within the regulatory system um, and incentives. Uh, find opportunities for better communication about impacts uh, to food and water from climate change, um, equity and protection to land and water access, um, invasive species control, larger regional biodiversity, biosecurity, um, ensuring diversity in agriculture, um, elevating the public trust and the resources needed for food production, uh, or through public trust, excuse me. And um, in terms of infrastructure, taking away the disincentives and restructuring local food so that it's competitive. Um, and if there's anyone else from that group, I was not in this group, if there's anyone from Food and Water who wants to add anything, thumbs up from Kirsten. Okay, um, in terms of human health, um, we talked in this group, and this is the one that I was in, about the importance of expanding and supporting interdisciplinary programs and peer-to-peer -peer learning groups. So that's something across these first two key messages already. How do we create these peer learning networks to accelerate this kind of action? Um, 
to holistically address these issues and share resources and build capacity. Um, and we heard some great examples of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary programs at um, JABSOM and uh, different, um, uh, different departments at UH and different state and um, city agencies that are working on um, working across and unsiloing um, knowledge around climate. Uh, the need to improve communication and information sharing by adapting approaches to best fit local communities. We were talking about how um, a lot of community members don't know where their emergency shelters are. And then I said, oh, I don't know where my emergency shelter is. And then we ran around the table and nobody knew where their emergency shelter was. So does anyone actually know where their emergency shelter location is? You do, good job, two people, three. <laughs> So obviously if we in this room don't know where our emergency shelters are, there's some work around communication that needs to be done. Um, so it's good to know that it wasn't just our table. Um, but yeah, for disaster response and emergency response, developing trusted information hubs to direct people to the right information, um, providing more resonant information to different communities uh, in ways that people are more receptive to, um, social media, apps, uh, working with teachers and having students then go home and teach their parents. Um, and then there was a lot of interest around increasing capacity to um, quantify mental health impacts from climate change and to provide greater mental health support and training and resources to community members who are dealing with these impacts. Um, for example, to different groups like Keiki and um, climate uh, people um, experience climate induced migration, refugees, um, groups that may need more um, outreach. In terms of um, infrastructure and um, sea level rise and local economies, um, a lot of words here. All right, so they wanted uh, to focus on equity considerations um, to really ask communities what they want in a localized way, um, to figure out how to get more community input into these plans. And I know that Leah and the Climate Action Planner, um, you know, really hammering home on that too, to, increase equity and increase community participation. Um, yet again, better coordination and alignment across plans at different scales and better interagency cooperation. So there are a couple of things that are coming out of all these key messages and all these discussions that I think go across all of the key messages um, and really you know, hint around what this plan could help do. Um, in terms of um, funding, looking at financing versus funding opportunities and challenges. Um, so encouraging the state to think about the complexities of financial resources for climate um, adaptation and mitigation issues. Um, so for example, cases in which upfront in investments are required, but there are long-term economic benefits and savings um, and how to quantify that and communicate those. Um, and how can we streamline access to these resources when local governments and community organizations may not have the capacity to access um, federal funding or manage it when it's available. Um, and then uh, noting specifically that we need to tackle the issues of mitigation, especially in tourism and aviation. Um, that's something that we're not um, really addressing at this point. All right, and the topic of ecosystems and biodiversity, um, doing more land use planning, uh, native Ohia forests are being cut down because they're not conservation land. So really thinking more critically because um, or putting things, balancing things when we're making these choices um, on our adaptive pathways forwards and how those might contribute to negative effects and having more data um, on what happens when neighborhoods are developed. Um, there are a couple points around cesspools uh, in this um, in this group, so elevating the conversation around cesspools. So um, they noted that federal funding was not able to be applied to cesspools. And then if you um, close a, a if you, if you uh, remediate a cesspool, where does the runoff go when you get rid of it? So being aware of those um, effects from um, the beginning to the end. Um, in terms of the workforce and biodiversity, uh, looking at salaries, talking about how much the state and the counties are paying people to do this kind of work, being able to pay people who are out in the field more in order to incentivize more people to go into these fields. Um, and then finally, continuing to build connection to the environment, learning from Takuna, interacting with the environment, um, and increasing education around conservation and environmental knowledge, which makes it easier to incorporate into your day-to-day -day life. 
Finally, um, from the Indigenous Knowledge Systems Discussion Group, um, three main points. The younger generation is motivated around climate change and they want to be involved and heard. So um, some of the discussion we had this morning, both in the groups and in the general discussion, um, was how to expose more students to place-based climate change adaptation science um, in relation to and in the context of indigenous and cultural knowledge. Um, and then just to note again that indigenous knowledge cannot just be taken or translated into Western terminology and presented as new. Um, that indigenous knowledge holders should be compensated monetarily or in other traditional ways. And indigenous uh, and cultural practitioner knowledge is science. Finally, there's a need for creating more educational resources based on foundational documents like the NCA5 and to highlight community INA-based stories that can be used in a variety of um, educational settings, including K-12 classrooms um, and community gatherings. Um, and these stories are an effective way to help others better understand climate change and its impacts. So just put that in the climate action plan and, and we'll be good. <laughs> All right, back to you, Laura. Aloha kako. I'm Udi Mandel. I work with Leia and uh, CC Mac as uh, the bill today. Um, so I'm the climate action program manager. So one of my tasks is to make some sense of this as we move forward. And uh, so thanks Victoria for that. And thanks for everyone to, that participated in the session earlier today. This is all incredibly useful and uh, really important stuff because one key thing about this action plan is how do we make it really actionable? Um, so I wanted to give a, a quick sense of what we had in mind, but the main message is that we want to basically deepen uh, these conversations that have been happening today. So one way of going about that is how do we kind of dig deeper into all of the, the different things that Victoria just shared to, to make them into more actionable uh, policies or practices that can be shared out into, into the state. Um, and to say too that the, uh, the Climate Action Plan is really building up on a lot of work that's been done already across the state and uh, the county level. So we can see, you can see the slide a bit, but there's some other uh, key things of which have been happening over the last few years, different documents that have been developed by different agencies. So uh, you have the nature-based resilience and adaptation to climate change document. Uh, recently, the Hawaii State Energy Office also put out this Hawaii Pathways to Decarbonization as well. And I know that all of the counties have been working to develop their own climate action plan as well. And we've been collaborating with the counties as well. So the, the question for this state level climate action plan is how do we harness all of this really amazing work that has been done over the last few years uh, into, this, uh, into this guiding document. So what do we want our, our climate action plan to look like? And, uh, and I really like the, this, uh, what we shared earlier, this idea of a sale plan. So maybe we can incorporate that into the climate action plan somehow, that this is also a sale plan. But the, we have a few Cs that this climate action plan that we want it to look like. First, it's, it's comprehensive. Um, that is that it's holistic, like, uh, like Christian was sharing earlier, like many of these different sectors, they have to be working uh, in concert with, with each other. That is an economy-wide approach. And also really important that it's equitable, that we're looking at um, different kinds of communities as uh, being part of, of this process. Uh, it's community-centric, so we're trying to co-develop it with listening to and participating with community voices that will have a say into this plan. Uh, it's important that it's concrete, the good kind of concrete, not the high emission kind of concrete. Concrete in terms of actions, policies, projects, and practices with identifiable agents that, that can implement them. We want it to be a creative plan, so innovative solutions that interwine uh, traditional knowledge like we've been talking about today with, uh, with other forms of, of, of science and knowledge too. And, um, and as I, I just shared, it's, that is cumulative, that's building on and refining the various kinds of work that ha have already started across uh, different agencies and the county. Uh, towards specific climate actions. So the, um, the Climate Commission has already developed a number of mitigation strategies, and you can see a lot of this from the, uh, on the website. Um, but the, here is a series that ha have already been outlined, and Leia 
mention some of the, the actions that the state has already implemented. But the strategies go along these, these kinds of categories here of uh, developing uh, walkable communities, improved transportation options, vehicle electrification, regenerative agriculture, nature-based solutions, protecting natural lands, green renewable energy, energy incentives, energy efficiency, waste prevention, and also really interestingly, this very innovative uh, approach too, which is talking about the circular economy. So developing joined up approach within the economy that also includes the, the ancient circular economy um, of our poor our system and other forms of, of land uh, management too. So how, how to get engaged into this plan? Um, so we have a few things that we're presenting today, but I think we're also very open to having you all approach us and, and coming up with other suggestions of ways that uh, you feel is effective. And I think the conversation this morning showed a really uh, interesting, creative way to harness all the amazing knowledge and experience that uh, so many of us in this room have. Um, but one thing that has been uh, working over the last few months is developing different technical and equity working groups and having different stakeholder meetings. And maybe we can envision even that some of the themes that Victoria just presented that they could become uh, technical working groups. But the idea then is that over the next year, we're gonna meet several times in each thematic group um, to identify actions, policies, projects, and practices that can be taken in each of the related category for the state, for the county governments, for businesses, organizations, communities, persons, and Ohana. So we really wanna identify very concrete things that can be taken out and implemented uh, on the ground. So the invitation here or the opportunity is to join uh, one of these working groups and to contribute your experience, skills, and ideas in the thematic area that you are interested in. The second key part of this is public engagement. So CMAC, we've hired three new outreach staff to directly connect with communities. Uh, so this would be direct outreach and talk story sessions, meeting people where they are. And it's our intention to bring the conversation of climate change to address everyday needs, such as cost of living, resilience, and health. So the opportunity here is to connect with our out outreach team and uh, I hope I'm still around here, but we've got Mel over there, Molly and Bill, who you met earlier, but to reach out to them and invite them to your next event or share your mana with them. But we really want this to be really connected to the community in, in, in many ways. So third, we have online engagement. So I don't know if how many of you have accessed the C, CMAX site, but you can, uh, I don't know if you can even reach the, the QR code from there, but it's, it's over there on the desk too. But have a look at the website. There's a lot of really great information there. Uh, but also we invite you to um, go into this online form, fill out, share this, well, uh, the, this link that has uh, a number of questions around uh, trying to capture some suggestions of, of things to be included within this, this climate action plan. So the other thing that's on the, on the website is this, what we're calling the Grants to Projects Bridge. So this is a, a platform that's connecting uh, potential projects to funding resources. So the idea here is to bring together similar projects to leverage knowledge exchange and to enhance the collaboration between community members and government agencies. So if you do have a project that will fit within this climate action uh, sphere, um, do check out this website that grants the projects bridge and do contribute uh, to that. And then further on too, in, in the coming months, to reach out to us and talk about any project ideas or organizations that are developing interesting things. We definitely wanna, wanna hear from you all. So um, we also have a very active social media presence where we were trying to put out information and educational posts, uh, highlighting work done by the commission, um, the different reports, but also the different partners um, that we're working with uh, in, in state agencies and in, in the county as well. So we're trying to amplify the work done by these partners and also community partners that we're collaborating with. So keep, keep an eye out uh, on that. And I think that's all from me. So this is a way to get in touch with us. Yeah, um, thank you.
Does anyone have any questions for us on that process, how to get involved, how we're going to achieve it all? Yeah, that's a good question. When? Um, so um, this is all made possible through a grant through um, EPA's Climate Pollution Reduction Initiative. Um, so they have set us a deadline of summer 2025. Um, so it's it's over a year that we have to do it, but uh, not still not a whole bunch of time. So we've we've already met, um, we've hooded up with our outreach folks um, to make sure that we start on the outreach now. Um, and we want this to, as you said, you know, really be an opportunity to co-develop it. So we want to start. We're obviously not starting from scratch because there's a lot of plans already in place, but we want to start from somewhere where we're not offering a document for folks to review, but that we're building this with community voices. Yes. It's on our website at climate.hawaii.gov. Um, if you go to resources, um, it's under there. Yeah, and there's also a form within that um, that you can submit your projects in. And both of the forms, both the Grants Projects Bridge um, form and our questions forms are relatively short. We wanted this to be an easy way for, for folks to engage. So just asking, you know, a couple of, of questions and you have a lot of flexibility in what you can answer if you want to or not. The Grants Projects Bridge is a little bit more refined because we do need to know some information so that we can find the right opportunities and, and connect the right people. Yes, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I was saying for a while, you know, the counties have kind of already done the work for us, so we're just going to kind of copy off of what they've already done. Um, but then I just heard Matt Bonzer speak not that long ago about how, you know, in, in their plan, they made a lot of recommendations of areas that they don't have jurisdiction for. So um, I don't want to say that anymore because I know that this the state has a lot of kuleana um, that we need to make sure we're doing. But, um, you know, we've become BFFs, um, us in the county is putting together our, our application. Our, our priority climate action plan actually came out um, a month ago. And um, we're putting in a, a coalition grant for the implementation funds for the, the same climate pollution reduction funds. So it's been a really great opportunity for us to all work really closely. Um, and, and we really hope to continue to, to build those relationships and keep that going. Next question. Yeah, that's a great question, and I don't think we've gotten that far to mapping it out. Um, I think that's probably a, a great strategy. You know, there's going to be certain things that are statewide implementation, um, and I think we want to balance, you know, the, the breaking down of silos with making sure that we're not just talking very broad strokes about things, but getting really, really specific. And actually, you know, that's the intention of our grants projects, right? It lists the things of, here's the projects where we can implement things. This is very specifically, we want to put bike lanes between KAL Moku and, um, you know, uh, you know, let's say like we, we really want to get that specific. Obviously, we'll be able to do that, be able to do that statewide, but you know, we want to achieve that as much as possible. Thanks, Vicki. Are you going to incorporate, I imagine you are, but um, maybe how are you going to incorporate workforce development into this, given the fact that NOAA had its climate ready workforce development? Um, proposal and even if Hawaii doesn't get ours, um, do you have any thoughts about how to make sure you incorporate that? Yeah, this is this is very much a, a leading question because we already have a meeting on the books on, on how we're going to talk about this. Um, but it's actually workforce is, is a is a required component of this plan. Um, the EPA understands the, the real importance of, of incorporating workforce into this. Um, and 
you know, we know here that, you know, unfortunately Hawaii has the, the brain drain where, where a lot of folks move to the continent or, or other places. Um, so our opportunity here is to think through how we can um, keep local people and provide really high quality jobs, not just any kind of jobs, but really high quality jobs where they're well paid um, at a living wage. Um, and then we also have the folks to implement actions. There's things, you know, just like we're working on where we know very clearly we don't have enough workforce in order to implement these actions. Um, you know, we, we don't have enough workforce to convert all of our cesspools by 2050. We just don't have that here. So those are things we know we need to address right now. Hi, thank you so much for this conference. Um, I am, uh, my name is Isis. Um, I am a legislative aide in Representative Amy Caruso's office. Um, so her district covers a lot of central Oahu and Waialua. So this was really um, kind of hopeful for us to go back to the community and say that this work is happening. So thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering, I'm kind of struggling with how to phrase this question, but I'm wondering what kinds of conversations are you all going to be able to have around the issue of militarization on the islands um, and that contribution to um, climate change and its effects? Um, and then also, uh, what if there's going to be a kind of global perspective able being able to be brought into this conversation as well, considering um, the impacts of mining um, for a lot of the resources for things like car electrification. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the two questions that come to mind for me. Thank you. Mahalo for those questions. Um, first with, you know, um, working with Department of Defense and the military, um, city and county of Honolulu have actually been great leaders in that and, and collaborating. And they just launched a, um, a, a collaboration um, in Kotlaupoko to look at, you know, the regional impacts of, of climate change and, and how um, they can work closely with DOD. So we're going to kind of take um, their lead um, and try to engage with them. You know, slowly and slowly, the state has been collaborating with them, but it is definitely one of our gaps in our inventories where we can't necessarily um, account for what they're doing because we have no jurisdiction over that. Um, and that's a really a big gap and a big challenge for us, but um, we definitely want to build those relationships and, and continue working with them. As far as the, the global scale, um, one of the initiatives that we're looking at is, especially with um, our Department of Health who manages our greenhouse gas inventory and um, with our state energy office is looking at life cycle emissions um, not just looking at, you know, just the emissions that we can kind of see on the ground, but, um, you know, where things come from and the emissions that they bring with them. Um, that's especially important for our agricultural sector, because when we're importing food, we're just looking at, you know, how many emissions it has from when it docks and so our grocery stores, whereas a locally produced agriculture has a lot of emissions tied to them within all the um, um, uh, nutrients you're putting into the ground to, you know, the production of the food and then and then the transportation piece. So we really want to try to work to incorporate that. Um, I wanted to highlight a question coming from the live stream. Um, how can people find out more about volunteering for technical working groups? Yeah, abs involved? absolutely. Um, one, you can um, reach out to, to Udi here. Um, his email is, well, We'll put it we'll put it live for everybody because it'll be hard to do. Um, but also, you know, you can um, submit in your in our forms that you'd like to be a part of it um, on our climate.hawaii.gov website, um, and then we'll make sure to to reach out to you. Uh, my email is up actually up on the screen there, so if you can you see it online, you can email me and I'll connect you to Judy. You can put information on this. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll put information on there too. Okay, awesome. Well, um, we're not done yet, folks. But oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> but don't worry, it's gonna be fun. So, um, you know, Udi and I were, were kind of brainstorming yesterday um, about how we can um, use all of your wonderful brains to, to make this a little bit easier for us. Um, so we're hoping that you folks can help us to get started. Um, one of the key things that we've heard all day today, um, and one of the key things that we've always really wanted to address is, is how do we talk about climate change 
without talking about climate change. And that's not to say, hey, let's never bring it up. But there's a lot of people that just don't connect with the concept of climate change. It's not necessarily that they don't believe in it, um, but that's not the forefront of their minds. They have other more important things to talk about. So we're just hoping that you folks can, um, you know, share some ways that we can talk about climate change without talking about climate change. And before I go on, my intention is um, we have um, some beautiful recycled paper um, that was used for packaging that I brought from home. So we're reducing waste here um, and some post-it notes. So I'm going to ask after I'm done walk, going through the questions, you folks to evenly divide yourself up um, and then answer the question and then go through each of the tables. So I'll give you folks like five to seven minutes to, to bounce between them. And then all of the answers that you're going to give us are going to really help us to guide our conversations and how we reach out to communities and how we build our climate action plan. Um, and um, it will be really helpful to us. So thank you in advance. Um, our second question is um, identifying underserved and underrepresented communities that we should reach out to. Um, this is really an important question because as you folks know, um, many of the federal mapping tools such as CGEST and uh, what's the other one? The, yeah, anyway, the federal mapping tools with, with um, equity just don't represent Hawaii properly. Um, and then we also, you know, we do have other mapping tools such as the ALICE mapping tools that do represent us a little bit better, but I'm sure there's other communities that, that we just need to highlight and we need to get to. And so having you folks share areas that you think really should be um, included in these conversations will really help us be able to um, send out our, our folks to go and, and in, include those conversations, um, those communities in the conversations. Um, also, one climate policy that would help you achieve climate action. Um, this legislative session has been really challenging. Um, I'm sure many of you um, have seen the, the Civil Beat article that came out today saying that uh, um, our climate emergency health fund um, died. Um, it's, it's one of those things that is, is, it's been really, really challenging to find funding for climate action that is consistent. Um, so, you know, what, what can help us is how do we put in policies into place that can help spur climate action that maybe are not funding? And are there any roadblocks that we can try our best to unblock? Um, and then also how to message the urgency of the climate crisis to spur action and not scare people into inaction. Because I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I have is trying to stay optimistic and, you know, encouraging that we're going to do this, we're going to achieve this, while also, you know, facing roadblocks and barriers and limitations to what we really can do. So, um, any ideas and concepts on, on how we can do that, especially, you know, here in Hawaii, um, would be really, really helpful. Any questions? Cool. Without further ado, let's break up and I'll let you know it's time to switch. Mahalo.
inspiring day. Really appreciate your, your continued energy throughout the day. I'm not gonna ask you folks to come back because I'm hearing a lot of really great conversations happening. And I wanna encourage those because as we heard, um, you know, more collaboration is needed, breaking down silos and whatnot. But I do want to mahalo everybody for all your efforts in making today happen. Um, you know, it, it was just really truly inspiring today um, to have um, everyone from um, Mason Fong, our freshman Kamehameha Schools, to Governor Green, to Uncle Archie and Jackie share, you know, these the importance of climate change and how we're really doing the right thing and, and all of us being here, we're on the right path and, and we have great supporters. Um, I just wanna remind everyone to come back tomorrow. We have um, some additional um, youth sessions with the High Cast Graduate Student Symposium, um, which is gonna be really exciting. We're also gonna have a youth networking event um, around lunchtime. So you don't have to be youth to join. Um, this will be an opportunity for us to connect our emerging scientists um, and some high school students with those that are more established professionals. So please come down so you can meet them and be inspired by them and uh, um, share your stories with them as well. Um, and then we also have our agroforestry session. Um, you know, agroforestry is, is really an emerging sector where it's going to be really important for us to um, both meet our greenhouse gas sequestration goals and um, our food production goals at the same time. Um, I just have to also mahalo all of the great partners that made today happen, um, including the USDA Southwest Climate Hug, Pacific RESA, Pacific Island Climate Adaptation Science Center, um, Hawaii Sea Grant, UHC TAR, the East West Center for hosting us, um, all of our partners that hosted side events here and on neighbor islands. And of course, my wonderful, amazing, awesome CC Mac team. Um, yeah. And with that, mahalo, and we'll see you tomorrow. Ohuiho.